Should be live at the moment. Let's see if Richard can. We are live, folks. This is my channel's live stream. First one I've done, actually, for this channel. Uh, the Rogues RPG. <clears throat> this will be a session you can watch later. It's specifically for Nick. Who can, we can help him make his character and get it all fleshed out. We have some details to run through, uh, particularly with skills. And he gets a feat, so we're going to go into feats as well. But what I will do prior to that and I would like to include as part of this live stream, is a quick rundown of character generation in the beginner box. <clears throat> right from the scratch. It's very easy. It's not a long process. I can go over a little bit for you guys that are curious about it and thinking about joining in our learning campaign for Pathfinder. Uh, maybe it'll help. Maybe it'll be entertaining. I don't know. We shall see. But I'll probably go into that for you guys. And we got Richard in the chat. I've only got seven. I got nine subscribers to the channel so far, so I'm, I don't expect a big audience today. How you doing, Richard? Uh, yeah, we got Rocky there. There's Rocky, my good friend Rocky from Rocky's War Room. Uh, but it says I have one viewer. Somebody disappeared. I got two people talking to me and only one viewer. What's going on here, folks? Yeah, this is what my plan is for this chat session. So we'll see how far we get along with it. Nick shall be joining us a little bit later uh, to finish off his uh, character. Should be an interesting character. He's playing an elven wizard. Nope, not a half-naked elven priestess, folks. Uh, we talked about that earlier. This is an elven wizard. We worked up his basic stats. We worked up his... Uh, uh, what else did we do? This went over his savings throws and things like that, his racial traits, things particular to the class of the wizard. Uh, is he going to be an evoker? That's interesting. Evocation. So we covered all that. Next up, we're going to get into skills with him. He's going to pick a bunch of skills. Uh, it's basically for the wizard class. He gets two right off the bat, two ranks. And on top of that, he gets his intelligence modifier added to that, which... With an intelligence score of 18, gives him a plus four intelligence modifier. So that converts to an additional four ranks of skills on top of the two that automatically come with the wizard class. Six ranks of skills and all. Fantastic. Almost like a rogue. Uh, so yeah, he's going to have plenty of skills uh, to pick. See what he wants to be proficient in. And we'll go over that when he gets here. Uh, prior to that, we'll go for a little walk through the basics of character generation using the Heroes Handbook, which comes in the beginner box, uh, which is what we are using for this learning campaign. Very basic stuff. doesn't have all the options, but the rules are the rules that you would experience with the full core rules. So nothing's changed. It's just there's not as much options and choices available to the players and the game master, uh, which makes sense. Uh, for this beginner's campaign, there's basically uh, three races available. you got your dwarf, you got your elf, and of course you've got your human. You'll pick one of those right from the get-go. Uh, after that, you will pick your class. And there's, I believe, four classes that are available to all players. There's the wizard, the spell-casting menace of the group. Uh, there's the fighter, which is the warrior, good with all kinds of weapons and armor. Then there's the rogue, or the sneaky type that likes to pick pockets and locks and comes in really handy uh, in a group effort. And then finally we have the cleric, which is the basically a warrior priest. You can imagine, cast spells but it gets its spells from deities or uh, beliefs. Uh, that's the first two things you do when you create a character. Get your race chosen and get your class. So the basic conception is right there. Next thing you do is you roll up your ability scores. There's six abilities that define every living creature in this game of Pathfinder. There is strength, there is dexterity, and there is constitution. Those are your physical abilities. Uh, and then you have the mental abilities, which are wisdom, intelligence, and charisma. Those six abilities define your character. And like I said, every character 
uh, in the game has ability scores. These typically range from 3 to 18. I believe 9 is the average for all living beings. Let me take a look at that. It is 10 to 11. That's the average range uh, that, for example, a typical human would be. Of course, elves and wizards might be a little different uh, depending on the stat. Elves are much more hardier than humans, and elves are a little bit more fragile than humans. So their constitution score might not be as high for elves as humans, uh, but it might be higher for dwarves than it is for humans. So how do we get these scores? Real simple. There's different methods in the full game, but uh, the one that's utilized in the beginner box is basically my favorite way of doing it. And you basically roll, each player will roll uh, 46, that's four six-sided dice, and drop the lowest score. The remaining three dice are added together to come up with the total. You write this total down and keep it on a little side of scratch paper. Uh, why? Because you're going to do this five more times. You're going to have a total of six different totals, six different scores. Uh, higher, the better. Obviously, the highest you can get with this is 18, and the minimum would be 3. Uh, so yeah, 46, drop the lowest, and do this six times. Uh, next step, once you've done that, is to assign each of these six scores that you rolled to one of the six abilities that I just described. Strength, Dex, Constitution, Wisdom, Charisma, etc. Uh, where you put your highest scores pretty much depends on your conception of your character uh, and also the class. You know, if you want him to be a fighter, you probably want to put your highest score in strength or constitution or dexterity if you want him good with bows or accuracy in shooting things. Uh, if you want him to be a wizard, you might want to put that highest score in something like intelligence. Cleric would be wisdom, uh, etc. And of course, there's secondary choices that are optimal for certain classes like uh ideally for the fighter high score goes to strength other options would be dexterity and con uh, that gives you higher hit points with con uh, and the more hit points you have the longer you live uh, dexterity like i said deals with accuracy and things like that so they would be your next second highest and third highest scores if you were going to be a fighter so that's how that works just Roll up those 46 uh, dice, drop in the lowest, get six scores, and then assign them to the uh, six ability score, abilities, traits, abilities. Uh, from that point, based on your race, you're going to modify some of those ability scores that you assigned. Uh, like I said, dwarves tend to be quite hardy. Uh, they get a bonus to their constitution. It's a plus one. Uh, elves aren't so hardy. Uh, they might suffer a penalty in constitution. Let's take a look at that. Elves will get a plus two to their dexterity and intelligence scores, uh, but they suffer a minus two in their constitution score. So whatever number you assign to constitution, if you're playing an elf, you got to subtract a further two points from that score. So say you're old, uh, nice beefy 15 and assigned it to constitution. Because you're an elf, your constitution 15 is modified permanently because of your race uh, to 13, 15 minus two. And that's how that works. Humans have no modifiers. The, the assumption is that your roles are standard and that's based on the human uh, abilities. So, but if you're an elf or you're a dwarf, you'll have modifiers and all. Go over the dwarf as well just for clarity here the dwarf adds two to his constitution and wisdom very wise because they're so ancient and they learn quite a bit through time uh minus two to the charisma they're kind of dour individuals I don't get along with many people uh, so the charisma hurts so that's how that works so there's your ability scores there's your racial modifiers to those ability scores that's how you generate those ability scores uh, you go to your class. Now your class defines a lot of things about you. Your class is what you do as an adventurer. Not necessarily your profession in life. You could be a seamstress. 
Who knows? Who became a fighter later on? But a fighter is an adventuring profession. That's how you'd view it in the Pathfinder game. So is a wizard. Uh, it's an adventuring career. Rogue, full of adventure there. Uh, it's not necessarily a thief, a rogue. Uh, you can see a uh, character class as being an adventuring career as opposed to just a career in general. Like a soldier isn't necessarily a fighter. You know, a soldier is a soldier. That's his career. Not exactly an adventure. But a fighter is a soldier that is adventuring. You could see it that way. So again, we have four classes. We got fighter, we got wizard, we got cleric, and we have rogue in the basic game. Uh, again, the core, full core rules have a ton of different classes you can be. It could be barbarians, for instance, and sorcerers, as opposed to just wizards. Uh, and so on. But in the basic game, it's just those four classes. And you just pick one that you want to be. Let me take a break here and listen to you guys in the chat here in case there's any questions. Uh, Richard's still chewing a tennis ball. Yeah, he got injured today. How you doing, Ian? Big chapa. How's your uh, situation with your uh, your brooder, Ian? Did you finally get it yet? What is today? Thursday? Hmm. Bastards did not get to come until tomorrow, I bet. If you're lucky. And I won't go into too much detail with the classes. It's enough to know that they are your adventuring uh, paths, your adventuring careers that you take. They can modify certain things and give you, grant you certain abilities that other classes don't have. Like, for instance, the fighter are pretty much, just by the nature of being in the profession of the fighter, uh, trained in just about every weapon out there, except the more exotic types. They can use any weapon they come upon. Uh, they can also wear any armor and shield they come upon. They're trained in it. They know how to use this stuff. Whereas a wizard, uh, they don't have that luxury. I mean, they're lucky if they know how to use a dagger. Simple weapons and that kind of thing. Clubs, that sort of thing. And they certainly can't wear any armor. They're not trained in using it or using these weapons. Of course, in the game, your wizard might decide, well, I'm going to pick up that bastard sword and see how good I can do with that. He's going to be penalized in combat for using that thing. He's not going to be as good with it as, say, uh, the fighter in the group. And he can always, the wizard can always uh, pick up a shield or don some armor as well, but it just won't be as effective. So they tend not to use those things anyway. Uh, but during the game, it is possible to become trained uh, to use those things uh, and still be a wizard. It's just to start off with, fighters would be trained in all that stuff right from the get-go. Wizards, not so much. Clerics, they have uh, also have training in weapons and armor, but not as much, particularly with weapons, as fighters. Uh, and rogues have a little bit here and there in terms of uh, weapons and uh, armor they can utilize. And the, the class puts limits and grants abilities uh, to its practitioners based on what it is. So every class has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. Uh, as you play the game and we start incorporating more of the full rules, it is possible to become multi-classed. I'm not going to go into that at all here, but I will say that a multi-classed character is someone who actually has more than one class uh, that he practices and has levels in. Uh, there's also what's known as prestige classes, which are a specialist specialization of a particular class. Like an assassin is a prestige class of the rogue. A rogue can uh, specialize in assassinations and that kind of thing. Again, that's further down the road in the full core game once you get along with learning this. So that's your classes. Once you've got your class picked and chosen and wrote down all your special abilities and limitations, you're good to go. You're ready to move on to skills and feats. We're going to get into that with Nick when he pops in here, hopefully. 
uh, skills define you in terms of what you're good at, what you know, the things you can do, or what you're particularly good at. Uh, everyday skills as well as specialized skills. Uh, examples might be the climbing skill. Basically means you're good at climbing and scaling surfaces, whether they're sheer or not. Uh, it's called the climbing skill. Something everybody can attempt. Okay, there's no limitation. You don't have to choose that skill to be able to use it. Climbing is a, you could call it an every, everyday skill. Uh, but how good you are at it, that's where ranks come in. Uh, every player, based on their class, gets so many ranks to put towards skills. In the case of uh, a wizard, for instance, they get two ranks to put in any uh, skills they want. Uh, this will be modified, this number of ranks will be modified by your intelligence modifier. Like in the case of Nick, he has a 18 intelligence, granting him a plus four intelligence modifier. So in this case, he gets plus four additional ranks on top of his two, which comes from being a wizard. So six in all. He will basically put those ranks in various skills of his choosing, any ones that he wants. Uh, the only restriction is that you cannot have more ranks in a skill than your character class level. Uh, Nick will be level one wizard, so he can have no more than one rank in any particular skill, such as climbing. Uh, that's the only real limit there is there. Some skills are trained only. Uh, and in the rule book, if you're following along in your rule book, they are grayed out. They have a gray background. Any skill that is trained only means just that. You can't, anybody just can't use it. You have to literally put a rank into it to ever use it. An example might be the spellcraft skill, which is where you use your skills to manipulate things of the magical nature, uh, maybe brewing potions or just or finding out what a potion is that kind of thing spellcraft not everybody has that skill it's not a typical everyday man skill so if you want that skill you have to literally put a rank in it to ever use it in the game uh, so that's a trained only skill uh, and finally there's a type of skill that is called a class skill and these are associated with specific classes. These are skills that that particular class, whatever it is, is good at. For example, spellcraft. Wizards uh, are good at that skill. They might have it as a class skill. I'd have to actually double check that. I know they have a lot of knowledge skills that are class skills. Let's take a quick flip through the rule book in here see that spellcraft is indeed one of the class skills of the wizard and all that is what all the class skill means is it's just a skill that may or may not be available to everybody maybe it's trained only but it's closely attuned to this class this class is good at that particular skill so often practitioners of that class like wizards uh, practice that skill like spellcraft now what does that mean rules wise it means as a class skill whenever that character of that class if he has that skill that class skill he's going to gain an additional bonus of plus three whenever he attempts that check and it's always a plus three uh, for a class skill that has at least one rank in it uh, a fighter does not have a class skill of spellcraft he would never gain that bonus only wizards would have that and possibly rogues and so on but these are class skills in other words they're, they're skills associated closely with your class you gain additional bonuses on the usage of that skill if it's a class skill something your class is familiar with uh, so that's a class skill uh, it's just a further way of defining skills so you got trained only skills, you got class skills, and then you just got skills that everybody can use. Uh, and you'll pick a certain number of those at the beginning during character creation based on your class. Uh, it'll give you a number of ranks for your class, and you'll add to that your intelligence modifier. Smarter dudes get more ranks, you know, they put stuff more in there. 
Um, so yeah, that's how skills work. And finally, the final thing you want to do uh, is choose a feat. A feat is something special. It's a special power that really defines you. It's very specific to you. And there's a whole slew of them in the rule book, uh, like power attack, <clears throat> uh, which gives you a bonus in damage when you attack somebody and hit them successfully. Uh, it's a big wind-up skilled attack on the opponent. It's called power attack. That's a feat that uh, might, a fighter might choose. Uh, it helps define the character. Uh, everybody at first level basically gets one feat. It's not based on class or race or anything, just one feat. The exception is humans who gain a bonus one at first level. So they start the game with two. And the reason for that is because all these silly races of elves and dwarves, they all seem to have pluses here and minuses there and all these bonus languages and stuff because, well, they're, they're dwarves, they're fantasy characters, and it best represents them in the game. But what about humans? Humans are humans, you know, kind of boring. Well, to make them interesting, they do have their own strengths. Like they gain bonus skill ranks just for being human. They gain a bonus number of ranks just for being human. Uh, they also gain a bonus feat, which gives them uh, some additional powers there. And they have some other little strengths and weaknesses here and there. That's how humans are handled in the game. Makes them more interesting. Uh, for the record, I do love playing the human race. I do. I love human clerics. I love playing them. I play them all the time. Uh, that's my favorite class uh, race combination. But there you go. That's basically how you create a character, and it's that simple. Uh, still no Nick. Let me check the chat here. Are you guys arguing in there again? Do I have to crack the whip? Now we got James in there. be a busy man today James so you have any questions about that I'm not really doing this for the sake of uh, teaching how to roll up a character basically killing time making the video kind of useful uh, if you're interested in joining the campaign but that is the basics of rolling up and generating a, a beginner box character I probably should check the chat here and see where our friends are at the moment. Always helpful if Nick has the link. He's charging his uh, iPad, I think. I know he's pretty eager to finish off his character for the campaign. Get it set to play anyway. I'll post him the link directly. So yeah, that's basic character generation. What we've been focused on currently with our new players, uh, Victoria, if you're out there, you're welcome to join as well. Uh, you're also ready to develop your, uh, or pick your skills and your feet. <clears throat> if you're watching, I'm not sure you are. Or if you watch this later, all good. So it's good when you approach character creation, have a concept from the get very beginning, as opposed to coming cold to the table with just your dice and your record sheet and just seeing what you get. You know, it's not very exciting and interesting. If you have an idea in your head, like, ah, yeah, this grizzled dwarf from the mountains afar uh, is a miner. Uh, all kinds of little 
ideas in your head come into mind. and That helps you actually decide where to put your uh, scores and your abilities. Like, well, should he be strong? You know, did he grow up that way? Or is he a unique dwarf who's not so strong and was bullied by the other dwarves? Or maybe grew up around humans, those were weak humans. That kind of thing. There's all kinds of little ideas you could come up with. And it's always great when you come to the table with uh, some kind of, some kind of a framework for your character. Uh, and then see what you get when you roll up those dice. Now, there are things. If you, I think if your highest score that you score, that you roll, is like a 13, uh, you can throw the character away and roll a new one. Or if your highest modifier is plus three in total out of all your mods, something like that. So there, it is possible to make a character that is just really not going to be fun to play because his stats are too low. It could happen. I haven't seen it happen. But it can happen, and GM can allow you to roll a new one, roll up, uh, six new numbers. But uh, that's rare. I don't know about you, James, if you've seen that happen. But uh, there's different ways to do it, too. There's point buys where you actually have points that you can spend on your stats. There's ways of doing it that way, and that's in the core rule book. But for the most part, I've, I, I've always enjoyed rolling it. Uh, hardcore in the old days that used to be just roll 3d6 for each stat and that's what you get that's pretty that could be pretty brutal if you're like a three for strength and you wanted to be a fighter uh, that's uh, that hurts uh, I love the 46 drop the lowest and set those six scores aside and then just assign them where you want that fit your concept I've always enjoyed that and I like that method uh, plan to keep using it well into the full core rules as we get down the road here with our campaign. That's my preferred way of doing it. Poops. Shaga, son of Shaga. <laughs> All your character concepts sound like orcs, Ian. <clears throat> Shaga with choppers. <laughs> Rolled a bad, badass four for World 6 3. But doesn't give a crap. Has a big, big chopper. Oh, God. Are you allowing some of the expanded BB classes that homebrewed the core classes for BB? BB, what is BB? Base, uh, beginner box? BB, okay, beginner box. Are you allowing some of the expanded beginner? Oh, yeah, that's right. I have access to them. I got them on my computer, and I've looked at a few. In fact, uh, my nephew's playing a, a barbarian. That's an optional one that you can use. And, but he's also wanting to play a half orc, and I don't think that's an option in the basic game. But I think uh, for his case, I can, I could get fit him in because it's just knowing the rules, really. It's no problem from him for him because he's always played one. It's just an effort for me because I got to make sure I go over that completely and add him to the game so I know all the rules. I know barbarians are a pain in the ass, really. I get all those uh, abilities. <clears throat> Uh, donkey milkman hi is this uh is this a D, D help stream <laughs> also the english civil war stuff is very nice would you go through it please english civil war beginner box this stream is primarily with pathfinder because it, this one in particular is dealing with our our uh, beginners campaign uh, we've got a bunch of new players that we're t I'm teaching the game to, and we're going through a campaign. And we're eventually going to be using the full core rule book, which is a big 500-page tome, uh, using the Rise of the Rune Lords campaign. Uh, that's the focus of it and uh, what we're talking about today primarily. Uh, where'd you get the English Civil War idea? God, I love the English Civil War, actually. It's funny you brought that up. Ian is the pro when it comes to the English Civil War, who's in the chat there on YouTube. <clears throat> uh, 
But uh, yeah, I, uh, James, I will be uh, adding them as needed. Like if a player wants to play something bad enough uh, and there's a beginner box supplement for it, I'll use that. Or I'll just pull it out of the core book and just uh, throw it in. But ideally, not at the moment. The only exception is my nephew. Oh, I've yet to actually take the time to uh, create his character yet. I just basically showed him the basics. Got him set up on Google Hangouts. So he's good to go. It's just a matter of getting together and rolling up the character like I just uh, talked about there. That's it, really. Uh, Farm green coats. <coughs> All of the stuff behind the hats, the tricorn and the bonnet. Those are my old reenacting gear. I've never reenacted, but I was being tempted into doing it and I still have some of the stuff but uh, that's a tricorn for the American War of Independence no French and Indian War sorry uh, bicorns were more popular in AWI that's for the French and Indian War and the bonnet is a Highlander's bonnet for the same conflict that's what that's about and I got a sword going there and a, and a bayonet that's an actual bayonet actually uh, from the American Civil War period That's a replica flintlock. <clears throat> That's just for looks when I do my other live streams for tabletop commanders and uh, our paint and chats, <clears throat> as well as my Dash of Elan channel, all about historical miniature wargaming and some fantasy and sci fi. Stay tuned. Massive upgrades coming to the channel. It's going to be very cool. Uh, stay tuned for that as I find time. I've been pretty busy lately. So that's what the stuff behind me is about. But uh, yeah, this is Pathfinder, my friend. Pathfinder, epic fantasy role playing. There's your hero's hand. But no, that's the Game Master's Guide. That's my little book. It's a great box set, by the way. If you're ever interested in getting into a game like Pathfinder, uh, which I highly recommend if you're interested in any kind of fantasy with a lot of grit to it. Uh, grab the beginner's box. It is definitely the way to go if you've never played a role-playing game or never played Pathfinder. Great uh, set of rules. It's easy to get through and play all the way up to like the fifth level. And beyond, if you want to download some of those B and B or beginner box supplements, which are free, like how do you play a, a barbarian class? You know, you can add it because it's not in the box set itself, but you get it as a free download that kind of thing uh great way to get into it before moving on to the full core rules which aren't really difficult it's just you know it's kind of daunting when you look at it for the first time it's very complete and it's really all you need to play the game once you graduate from the beginner box and paizo the publisher publishes tons of supplements and adventures and campaign guides and scenarios and adventure path series stuff just tons of stuff for the past what 10 plus years now uh, and it is very daunting and it could make the game extremely complex and borderline unplayable <laughs> for a lot of people because it's just too much you can't you can't use everything unless you've been there from the beginning uh, so I, all you really need is just the core rule book and you're good to go. And that includes for the game master too. Just the core rule book and you're good to go. Maybe buy an adventure for a couple bucks or a free download or a complete campaign for like uh, like Rise of the Rune Lords here, which is a pretty big book. It's like six separate adventures. It's a complete linked campaign. Perfect for beginners. Uh, great epic story from what I hear. I've yet to read it, but uh, something like this will cost you like 50 bucks. It's an anniversary edition, no less. But you can buy the scenarios separately for much cheaper. Uh, 
And of course, here's the tome itself. That is the core rule book. Get yourself this. And the GM should probably get himself at least the bestiary one or the bestiary, uh, basically a monster manual. There's like, there's a ton of them they produce. I think they're up to six or seven now. Uh, I don't know. But get yourself the first one, maybe the second one. You're good. You are good to go. So that's a rundown of Pathfinder if you're unfamiliar. The basics, how to get started, and how to roll up a character in general. <clears throat> well, right now, James, I'm waiting for Nick to join in. I'm not sure Richard's joining. He's kind of injured at the moment, but he is in the chat. On YouTube. Uh, as soon as Nick is fully charged and good to go, he's going to hop in. We're going to finish our characters. So I'll, I'll be on a while yet. I'm not going to go anywhere. As long as I could keep talking about relevant subject matter. That's the challenge at this point because I'm waiting for Nick. I'm running out of things to talk about, folks. Oh, my God. <clears throat> but I'll be here. Don't worry about it. So anyway... I don't want to have to revert to talking about historical miniatures. This is my role-playing channel, by God. Uh, hallelujah. Let me double-check uh, Nick. Interested in playing, Ian? You're going to be a guest. I think you're going to have fun just sitting there laughing at us before you come in. Uh, let's see what we got going here. All right, we'll see if Nick will be joining. Again, he's charging his iPad. Okay, what else can we talk about? Uh, I want to keep this relevant to the channel uh, without boring people. Went over this with Nick. Uh, to play online, one thing you will need is dice. Nick, he has all the dice actually except for D4s, D12s. D8, no, D8s. D8s and D4s, he doesn't have. He's got everything else. He's got the D20. He's got the D12. Uh, I think the D10. He's missing the D8 and the D4s. And of course, he has lots of D6s. And so what he's going to use, he's going to use a dice app, I think. Oh, there he is, folks. He snuck in when I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> the man okay, is arrived. Sorry. How you doing, Nick? I'm fine, I'm fine. We are live, my friend. I've been talking to the folks. It's pretty much Ian and James and some of the other fellows from the community uh, about, about character generation and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to be Fantastic. and what we're going to be covering today. Let me fix your volume here. Yeah, yeah. What is this? Introducing control room for hangouts on air. Yeah, I know about this. All right. How you doing, Nick? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? Awesome. I'm doing pretty good so far. Uh, everybody in the chat says hi. It's James and Rocky. Uh, James, Ian. Chris, I'd love to join in on this, but time is an issue. Oh, that's that's perfectly fine, man. It's it's primarily for me and Nick, but I'm broadcasting this so you guys can see and learn about some of the basics of rolling up a character, how easy it is, uh, that kind of thing. I want to do more of these live ones, actually. 
all is good. Uh, Ian. I would love to make a cameo appearance as any number of characters you might need for the campaign. I appreciate that, Ian. I'm looking forward to it, actually. Because uh, you are you are good at that. You've got a great voice. You've got great personality. You could role play a rock if you wanted it. It would be quite convincing. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, card game. There is Paizo. Again, that's the publisher of uh, the Pathfinder product line. Uh, they do make a card game that's called, I don't, is it the Pathfinder card game? I think that's what it's called. Uh, there's various, they're in packs like adventures, like Rise of the Rune Lords is a pack of cards that is based on uh, the campaign I just showed you, which is the role-playing version. Uh, but you play the game with cards, and I guess you have your character, and you, you're just using cards to keep track of things and uh, magic items and uh the adventure unfolds through the deck of cards. I've never played it. I've seen it here and there. <clears throat> I know one of our players currently, Ben Abbott, uh, he's in the campaign, and he has played a little bit of the the card game version. I don't know if it's solo capable or I don't really know how it works, but yeah, they do actually make one uh, card game version. It's obviously not a full role-playing game, uh, I don't know much about it. <laughs> A chapa off the old black. <laughs> it would be a rock with a big chapa. Who, Ian? I think it was Nick that said Ian would make a great dwarf. Yeah, only a dwarf. A dwarf only a, lord or something. A dwarf lord. Yeah, he would. He'd be good at it. I, I think Ian, when he does make his cameo, and eventually we'll see. He might even join full time when we get going. And he sees how fun it is. Uh, he would be a great ad. He's one of those rare individuals out there who's, who's got the voice uh, of, an, of, an, of a storyteller. I was going to say actor, but... I don't know. Maybe he does that too, but I think I think he would be a perfect ad. I think whatever character role I gave him, he would play it to a T, and it would be very convincing. Uh, and I like that. I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, if he's going to be a dwarf lord, he would come off as a dwarf lord. Yeah. Can you guys hear me and Nick all right in the chat? <clears throat> Let me turn Nick's volume up just a little bit. Right. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Right there. <clears throat> uh, Sad Zapra actor on board and on board the ships. What? <laughs> Sad's opera actor on board the ships. Oh boy, <clears throat> I'm confused. Rephrase that. I'm lost. Ian, you confused me. Sad's, you're silly. Sad. <clears throat> yes, loud and clear. Good. Anyway, about the dice, there are apps you can get to play games online that'll roll up all <clears throat> kinds of dice, like D12s and D4s, and all the dice you might be missing. I know Victoria, who's going to be joining our campaign, or plans to. She's using uh, Dice App for all of her dice rolls. Uh, Nick has access to dice, but like I said, he's missing a few. How are you going to handle your D4 rolls, Nick? Uh, you, there is an app I can use. You told me something like this. You can. I can get. I can get their dice here, but uh, I don't know if they have this, all the specialized ones. No, if you if you got if you can find an app, they have all the mm -hmm. different dice. Nope. But yeah. no problem at the moment. It's always a plus if you got the dice, folks, if you're interested in playing. Uh, let's see. An app would work fine. I have the 10 and the 12, I think, correct? I know you got the D20. I think yeah. I saw you with the D12 and I believe the D10. You have yeah, D6s, yeah. of course. I think the only one you need is the D8 and D4. Those two. Okay. 
<clears throat> and the D4, of course, is that little pyramid. Where yeah. is it? There it is. These little guys right there. That's the D4. Ah, uh, okay. There's a trick to rolling with these. And how do you roll this thing? Not many people know how to roll a D4, but you're not supposed to shake it in your hand and just chuck it like you do a D6. You're supposed to take uh -huh. these and shake it around and drop it straight down and let it bounce. Uh, and then it I'll lands on its proper side. Or you can put them in your mouth and spit them out. I've seen people do that, and I won't go into that. <clears throat> <laughs> no, no. Uh, spoof. A foul mouth play is acted out in the Royal Navy ships by the crews from drunk for drunken entertainment. Ah, there it is. Is he in? Ian's in there. He's he's watching. He's paying attention to our shenanigans here in the role playing chat. J uh, Richard is injured. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be joining in or not. He he can't really. I don't know. He's injured. I'm not going to go into the details, but he's in the chat on YouTube. And he says, launch it. Is that an app roller, Richard? Launch it. God, I love my chair. I can swivel. Ah. My mic. I love my mic. <laughs> Hide the ladies. Crank the volume. The show is about to begin. You got to get one of these mics. Uh, Nick, you got a great voice too. Fantastic. <laughs> you got that accent going on that the, all, the, all the ladies love. They dig that. Yeah, we're going to then <laughs> we have to make it, I told you, PG-18. PG-18. Oh, my God. Uh, no, I meant how to roll a D4. Launch it. Yeah, shoot it off. Yeah, you pretty much just drop it straight down. It's a tricky little bugger. God, don't step on these things. They are terrible to step on. Whew, nasty. Nice yeah, point, yeah. little pyramids. Terrible. All right. Let's get into this a little bit here, this character uh, creation with Nick. Uh, I believe, Nick, we're all the way up to skills. Yeah. Kurt, can I recap what I have? Because I wrote them yes. last time in a piece of paper, and now I wrote them clearly. So I don't know what I'm missing or I'm wrong because you have it in, uh, written also, correct? Yes, I do. So I have uh, ability scores. I have strength 10. Right. Dexterity 19. I have dexterity 16. Ah, 16. Okay. Maybe I'm mistaken. Because I had in my marks 14 plus 2 plus 3. Maybe I... It's All, right. All right. What, what you have here is you have the value... Okay. Yeah. And then there's a column next to it that has the the modifier. Yeah. Like strength, it should be ten, and then a plus zero. Is exactly. Then your I dexterity have... should be yeah. sixteen with a plus three. Okay, that would so equal it's... nineteen. So maybe that's where. You yeah. Get. Ah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, so, so it's just sixteen and then a plus three. Uh, how I counted sixteen plus three, or I have nineteen. How I counted. 16 yes plus three and then a plus three for the modifier okay keep, those numbers are separate they don't, they're not added together you keep them separate yes i have it i have like dexterity i have 14 plus two plus three because it's the modifiers okay constitution i have uh 13 it's 14 minus two plus one if you if you guys watch in the video this is what we're talking about you see, each ability has a score, like I went over with, over on how you generate earlier. And then there's another column called ability modifiers. Now, these modifiers are based on your actual score. The higher your value, the bigger your modifier will be. Okay, so that's, that's how that works. So for Nick, his strength is 10. He has a plus zero modifier. Whenever he uses strength and rolls a die for it, He'll add plus zero. Uh, on the other hand, for his dexterity, he has a 16. This says 11, but it should be 16. And the modifier for that score would be a plus three. So whenever he uses his dexterity and rolls a die, he's going to roll the die and add plus three. Whenever it's a dexterity-based check. So that's how that works. So uh, let's see. So constitution, constitution, I have 13. 
Yeah, I, I, I see what you did. You you took your base score and you added the modifier to it. You don't do that. You keep them separate. Okay. It's 12. Plus one. 12 plus the, one. Right. And the modifier is plus one. Yeah. Uh, so for, uh, in for, uh, for intelligence, I have 18 plus four. Exactly. Okay. So that your your intelligence score is eighteen. Yes, and, and because plus four it's is the and because it's eighteen, you get a plus four on any die rolls that are based on your intelligence uh, score. That's how that so, works. Yeah, yeah. So unlike the real me in the game, I'm very clever. <laughs> nah, <laughs> you're always and, clever. And the other are eleven and eleven. I don't know how eleven, eleven, and eleven. Right. Okay. Wisdom, 11 plus zero modifier, and charisma, yeah. 11 plus zero modifier. So as you can yeah. see, folks, uh, our wizard here, our elven wizard, is very intelligent with a score of 18, which grants him a plus four anytime he makes a, a check using intelligence, like spellcraft. We talked about that earlier. I believe spellcraft is based on intelligence. So whenever he makes a spellcraft check, uh, to see how successful he is, he rolls his dice, d20, and because his intelligence is so high, and this is an intelligence-based skill, he gets a plus four to the roll. So you can see how he's more likely to be successful uh, with intelligence-based checks, with spellcraft in this case. Uh, there's other modifiers that would and could ap apply to as well, but we'll get into that later. That's the ability scores you got, Nick. Yeah, so let me tell you what else I've written. I have speed 30 feet. I have uh, uh, low light low light vision. I see twice as far in dim light, correct? Right, and that's because you're an elf. Elf. I have sleep immunity. That is because you're an elf. These are, these are racial traits that you have. They are speed 30, low light vision, elven sleep immunity. Yeah. Keen and, senses. Uh, uh, keen senses, I didn't have it. Wait, I forgot it. Keen senses. Okay. Yeah. And what keen senses is, folks, is elves are good at spotting details. Uh, they gain a plus two miscellaneous modifier to their perception skill. Perception is a skill in this game. It's your ability to observe, uh, whether consciously or subconsciously. It's your ability to observe. And in the case of an elf character just the elf race they have what's called keen senses it's a trait associated with elves and they always get a plus two whenever they make a perception skill check keen senses i have now let me see, continue the last ones I, my weapons that i am uh, because of I'm, I'm an elf i have a long bow long short short bow rapier club dagger heavy crossbow all right wait crossbow. stop there stop there yeah. Now, the racial weapon familiarity is only four weapons. Longbow, yeah, these four. Yeah, longsword, yeah, yeah. rapier, yes, yes. and shortbow. That's because of your race. Now, yes. God forbid if God your forbid. race is ever changed, say, magically, uh, you would lose familiarity with those weapons. So in that case, you might want to make a distinction as to these weapons are racial yeah, but I wrote it, weapons. Yeah. As opposed to what you're trained in from your class. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, from my class, I'm I'm trained in club dagger, heavy crossbow, light crossbow, and quarter stuff. You got it. That's it. Okay. Now I I decided I'm a, voc I, a evoker, correct? You chose the evocation evocation school. Uh, yeah. There was three available to Nick in the basic game. There's the Universalist, which basically is a wizard that pulls from all the different schools and learns all kinds of different things and not really a lot of restrictions. There's also the Evocation and the Illusion schools. Now, Nick chose Evocation, and that magic is all about creating and controlling energy. Many evokers focus on attack spells rather than defense or trickery. So it's it's yes. all about control. Uh, of course. And if I remember well, you told me I have um, Burning Hands ability once per day and Forced Missile seven times per day, per day or I'm mistaken here? For the Evocation School, uh, your special abilities that you get, you have Burning Hands, which is basically the spell, Burning Hands. One, yeah. Once per day. Very good. Correct. Your second ability for being an Evoker 
is what's called force missile. And it's yes. basically the force missile. Uh, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's three plus your intelligence modifier per day. So three plus yes. your intelligence mod is. Plus, yes. Three plus uh, four. Yep. So it's seven. Right. Every seven day. times seven per, per day. day. That's oh, per I can. I can missile seven times a day. Oh, fuck. Very yeah. Good. Now, these aren't spells per se. These are special abilities you can always do because you're an evoker. Uh, basically, I'll give you a rundown real quick of what this is. You blast one opponent within 30 feet, dealing 1d4 plus one points of damage. Ah, you need a d4 for that, Nick. Mm -hmm. Using the ability is a standard action. You can do this a number of times equal to three plus your intelligence mod. So that for the folks at home is how you use force missile. Pretty cool. Seven times, Nick. Yikes. Yes, and burning hands, I can at least cook something very easily. Yeah, you, it, that is literally the burning hands spell. So that we could look up under burning hands uh, once per day for that. Uh, also, as an evoker, this is really important because it's a specialist school. Uh, you can't use every spell available that's out there. I know. Uh, yes, I have it here. Yes, I have the restrictions. I remember you wrote them to me. Uh, let me see if I have them correctly. One second, because I was fixing this. Um, I cannot do uh, acid arrow, uh, invisibility. Uh, what else have I written here? Mage armor. Uh, this is stinking cloud. That's better. I cannot do this. Um, and uh, disguise and something else I cannot read here. This displacement. This. I cannot do it right. and there's one more web oh, yeah. a web yes i have it here yeah, yeah yeah and now what else i have i have uh fortitude one reflex three and will two all right and for everybody at home and to clarify again for nick uh this is called your savings throws mm -hmm. uh everybody has these uh, and there's three of them there's your fortitude save there is your reflex save, and there is what's known as your will save. And each of these three saves is based on one of the key abilities we talked about earlier. Fortitude is constitution, reflex is dexterity, and will is your wisdom. Uh, basically, for these three saves, your class tells you right off the bat if you gain some kind of bonus just because you're a member of that class now in the case of nick here a wizard he automatically gets a plus two on all of his will saves but a plus zero on the other two saves he gets no special benefit for fortitude and reflex saves mm -hmm. but wizards gain a plus two will save right off the bat just for being a member of that class the wizard mm -hmm. now on top of this he's going to be adding his ability score modifier to these saves. Uh, you should have a, a second column next to this. Yes, I have ability and miscellaneous. I have them. Yeah, yeah. Right, and for ability, it's for fortitude. It's going to be your con modifier, which I believe is plus one. Yeah. Your reflex is going to be your dex modifier, which I believe is plus three. Yeah. And for will, that is your uh, that's your uh, wisdom. Yeah, That's going to be a plus zero, mm -hmm. but you do get the plus two for the class. Yeah. And this goes one, three, and two. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, and they all add together. Yeah. And then uh, I have attack bonus zero, hit point six plus one, and that's what I have here. Right. Your hit points, you start off the game... Uh, with a fixed number of hit points. For a wizard, it's six. Now, on top of that, you get your constitution modifier as a bonus. Uh, Nick's constitution modifier is plus one. So his total hit points score is six <coughs> plus one, which is yep. seven. So that would be seven, Nick. Yeah, yeah seven. So this is the, the what I have. I had some other, but I cannot find them now. Uh, <clears throat> Cantrips I have, right? That you that you told me detect magic, mage hand, uh, 
a ray of frost and dead magic read magic <laughs> i read magic okay, okay. you got it those are cantrips there's uh basically two types of spells for wizards they're cantrips which are really minor spells you can do them almost at will uh, they're almost always available and then there's proper magic spells that are literally written down in Nick's spell book that he keeps and maintains and protects with his life uh, that lists all the spells of any substantial power that he can memorize at the start of every day and have access to casting throughout that day. Uh, but cantrips, cantrips are pretty much always there. He doesn't have to memorize them each day. Uh, and there's four of them in the basic game. There is detect magic. Uh, there's Mage Hand, there's Ray of Frost, and there's Read Magic. Those are your cantrips. Yep. Uh, this okay. is what I have. You're good. And there's also this, Nick. And maybe you forgot this one, but you have a special ability associated with the wizard, and it's called Arcane Bond. Oh, okay. I don't know if we went into that, did we? I know we talked about it. I'm not sure. We talked, we... but not, not that much, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The Arcane <coughs> Bond. I'll read this to you for all the viewers. If I can see, it's getting dark in here already. My glasses are fogging up. Holy smokes. What are you guys talking about? in the chat there uh choose one of these items masterwork dagger a masterwork quarterstaff a ring or a wand write arcane bond next to this item on your character sheet you get this item for free you automatically get it okay once per day you can use it to cast any one spell that's in your spell book you don't have to prepare this spell ahead of time. Using the bonded item is like an emergency backup spell uh, that isn't written down in, on your list of prepared spells. Replacing a lost or destroyed bonded item costs 200 gold pieces. Ouch. So choose an item, a masterwork dagger, a masterwork quarter staff, a ring, or a wand. You get that item for free automatically. Yeah, uh, I will get them uh, as my uh, character picture shows, I think, a uh, quarter staff. All right, you have a masterwork quarter staff. <clears throat> this is uh, the, it's, uh, the, the stick, basically, huh? Uh, no, this is a masterwork quarter staff. A quarter staff, if you go back to the Middle Ages and that kind of thing, it's a it's a fighting stick, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like that, but this is a masterwork. And what that means is that the weapon, I believe, you'll have to correct me, Richard, about this. I'll have to look it up. But a masterwork gives you a bonus, a small bonus to hit or to damage. One or the other. I can't remember. They're very expensive. They're extremely well-designed and well-balanced normal items. There's nothing magical about it. It's just, it's just a <coughs> masterwork uh, item. In your case, it'll be a quarter staff. So yep. you get it automatically, and it's going to be an, a bonded uh, quarter staff, which allows you to put a spell in there and use it as emergency backup. So just put arcane bond, masterwork, quarter staff. <clears throat> and Richard is in the chat. I could look this up real quick myself. Let's see. Masterwork weapons. Uh, you get a plus one bonus on your attack rolls, and that's it. So you wouldn't get a bonus on damage or anything, just on your attack roll. Okay. That's what a masterwork item is. And they're usually really freaking expensive for some reason. But anyway, you, you get this one for free. That's right, Richard. Thanks. Plus one to hit. Now, where are we? So that's your arcane bond. Uh, you have a spell book. And it's, of course, it's got your spells in it that you memorize at the start of every day. 
Uh, I guess we should probably go into that and pick what spells you start off knowing in your spell book. Now, we already went over the cantrips. There's four of them, and you know them. Uh, three plus your intelligence bonus. That's seven. Okay. That is the number of spells that you can have written down at the start of play in your spell book. So what you probably want to do is make a separate sheet of paper and put at yeah. the top spell book. And these are the spells currently in your spell book. Okay. Well, you get to choose. There's seven of them. Good. You get to choose okay. them. Uh, do you have access to your book, your rule book? No. Uh, no, no, because I have only this iPad for the time being until I get my PC. Uh, but um, if you can help me, it would be great. All right. We'll do this step by step. First of all, I got to get a light on over here. Hold on, folks. Starting to get dark. I can't see. So, now I can sorry. read properly. It's not no, this is you. This is me. I have to do this anyway. It's the time of day. Let's see if this works. Get that camera angled right. There we go. Now I can see. Golden. I am golden. I had to fight a bloody goblin king to get my masterwork dagger. Elves get one for free. No, it's the wizard class that gets it. You're not a you're not a tall elf, are you? <laughs> That's Richard. <laughs> is, uh, Richard is a dwarf, huh? Yeah, he's a he's a yeah he's a dwarf, all right. <clears throat> right typical dwarf, jealous all the time. Degrim pump sucker. There's a story behind that, folks. <laughs> I love creativity. All right, here's what we'll do. Uh, you're going to get seven spells. I'm going to go through them. It's it's not a long list. It's These are all first level spells. No problem. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you the name of it, a short description. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in it, just put make a little note. Yeah. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten in all. So three okay. of them you're not going to take. Okay. All right, the first one. This one is called Alarm. It has a range of 30 feet. It lasts for two hours per wizard level. You're level one, which means mm -hmm. it'll last two hours. A quick description. You pick a 20... Wait a minute, let me turn my game down. You pick a 20-foot radius area, like a campsite, for instance. Mm -hmm. If any... If any creature other than you or your allies enters that area, a loud ringing noise starts, which wakes up everyone. Invisible or sneaking creatures can set off this kind of alarm. So it's useful. Okay. Yeah. The next one, and you'll 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 definitely take an interest in this spell because you have it as a special ability as well for being an evoker. It's called Burning Hands. Range 15 feet from you. Duration is instantaneous. You create a 15-foot-long cone of fire from your hands. Creatures in the cone take 1d4 points of fire damage per wizard level. Each creature can make a reflex savings throw to take only half of the damage. Okay? Yeah. The next spell is called Cause fear. Uh oh. Range 30 feet. Duration 1d4 rounds. You'd roll 1d4 to see how long it lasts. You cast this on an enemy who gets to make a will savings throw to resist the spell. <clears throat> if he does not resist, in other words, he fails the savings throw, he runs away from you uh, for the duration of the spell. Mm -hmm. You can't cast this on mindless creatures or creatures with. Oh, I can't read it. I had to write this down in pencil. CR four plus. That's challenge rating. Uh, it won't affect zombies, for instance. Mindless yeah, creatures. All right. Your next spell is called Charm Person. Quite useful. Mm -hmm. uh, range 30 feet. Lasts one hour per wizard level. 
You make a humanoid enemy think you are its friend. Though this doesn't mean you can give it orders. Just a friend. You convince it. It will make a will savings throw to resist. If you or your allies are attacking it, it gets a plus five on this savings throw. You can't cast this on mindless creatures. Okay. So imagine yourself approaching the gates of the castle of so-and-so, and there's a guard looking quite uh, menacing before you. Ah, uh, the elf steps forward and immediately casts Charm Person on this, yeah, 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 of course. On this uh, guard. You'd role play it out, describe it if you wish, and he would make his savings throw, in this case a will savings throw. If he fails it, you'll know that he failed it because he'll suddenly be your friend. You know, yep. that's, that's how it works. Pretty cool and useful, charm person. Next, detect secret doors. Range 60 feet. Duration 10 minutes per wizard level. Again, you're level one. <clears throat> you can sense secret doors and hidden passageways when you cast this spell. On the round that you cast it, you sense if there is any such portal in range. On the second round, you know how many there are. On the third round, from when you initially casted it, you know exactly where they are and how to open them. Pretty useful. Yeah. When you enter a, a room and you suspect there might be secret doors, pretty useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next is Disguise Self. I believe this is a spell you cannot learn. Yeah, I know. Let me double check your disguise self. It's from the ones I cannot use. Yep. So we'll skip that. You can't learn that. Yeah. Can't use it. Here's a really useful one. Comes in handy in adventures. In my experience, it's called Featherfall. A really useful first level spell. Uh, range 30 feet. Duration is until target lands. You choose a number of allies friends equal to your wizard level again you're level one currently who fall slowly 60 feet per round and don't take damage from the fall though they can still be hurt if they land on something dangerous like spikes or lava you can cast this spell as a free action we'll get into actions later on when we actually start playing but it's easy to do could save some lives with that if you ever fall off a cliff or into a deep crevice or pit or whatever you can imagine. Fall out of a tree. <clears throat> you are your friends. All right, feather fall. Next, mage armor, which I don't think you can cast. I cannot either. guess. I cannot guess. Next is magic missile. Yeah. Range, 100 feet. Duration, instantaneous. Boom. You fire a blast of magical force that automatically hits an enemy and deals 1d4 plus 1 points of damage. Mm -hmm. At third level, you fire two missiles with each casting. At fifth level, you fire three missiles. You can fire the missiles at different targets. As you gain levels in your class, you'll your spell becomes more and more powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's basically a, a missile mm. that does 1d4 points plus one damage. And it automatically hits. That's important. Yep. Regardless of the target's armor or how how good dex dextrose he is, you hit him. Boom. It's magic. Uh finally, you have sleep. Something elves are immune to. Range, 100 feet. Duration, one minute per wizard level. Living creatures in a 10-foot radius fall asleep. Choose up to four creatures in this area, ignoring creatures that are unconscious, mindless, constructs, or level five or greater, or challenge rating three or greater. Creatures can make a will savings throw to resist waking or waking a sleeping creature is a standard action noise is not enough to wake to 
to awake them, those yep. magically induced into sleep. All right, let me see. Those are the 10 spells. They're all available to you except for two. Oh, and one eight, you always so have. And one you always have because you're an evoker that's burning hands. Uh, but you can also take it as a spell, but there's just to use it more often, you know, if you yeah. got it as a spell as well as a special ability because it's oh, once, good. once per day. Okay, let me choose. So I cannot choose uh, magic armor and uh, disguise self. So I will take alarm for sure. I will take cast fear. I will take charm person, detect secret door, feather fall for sure. Uh, and now I, I have to choose two out of three. There is burning hands, magic missile, and sleep. Actually, I have burning hands. Anyway, so I will choose magic missile and sleep. Okay. All right, so you have alarm, cause fear, correct? Yep, yep. Charm person? Mm hmm. Detect secret doors? Yep. Feather fall? Yes. Magic missile? Exactly. And sleep? Yep. Strong. Good. Seven spells in all. These are the ones that are written down in your spell book. Now, mm -hmm. how this works, folks, and Nick, I, I talked to Nick about this earlier, but the start of every day or 24-hour period, however you want to look at it, uh, he gets to go through his spell book and prepare uh, a certain number of these spells that are in his spell book. And when he prepares them, they're available to him to cast during the 24-hour period uh, or the adventure, basically. Now, how it works for first level character, you can prepare one first level wizard spell per day from the list of spells in your spell book. If your intelligence score is 12 or higher, which it is for Nick, you can prepare a bonus spell, an extra first level spell from your book. So he's going to, because his intelligence is so high, it's 18, he's going to have two spells uh, prepared at the start of each day and he'll pick from his spell book which ones they are uh, they could be the same spell he could choose like uh, alarm twice for some weird reason just in case they're camping for a long time or he could choose magic missile and uh, sleep for instance whatever he has written in his spell book now during the adventure one of the great prizes for a wizard character is finding a scroll a wizard scroll, or even better, finding another spell book. Oh my God, gold mine jackpot. He got it made. Because what that means is suddenly his character has access to new spells that he can jot down in his own spell book, uh, depending on how powerful they are. Uh, it, the result of this is he might actually have access to spells that are so powerful, he can write them down in his book, but he can't cast them yet. So there are limits to it, but it's good to keep your eye open, Nick, for spell books and wizard scrolls, baby. That's yeah, yeah. Your spell book is your lifeblood as a wizard character. You lose that, you're in trouble. Yep. Uh, anyway, that's a nifty picture. <clears throat> so there you go, my friend. You have your spells. Now there are different levels of spells. There's level two spells, level three spells, and so on. I think it goes up to nine, level nine, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that the higher the level of it, the more powerful the spell is. Uh, okay. And that's it. That's enough of that about your class. Now we can actually get into the skills. No, we have skills also good. Oh yeah, you get skills. Skills represent the fundamental abilities your character has. As your character advances in level, he or she can gain new skills and improve his or her existing skills dramatically. At first level, uh, based on your class, you're going to gain a number of skill ranks. Your class, Wizard, allows you two skill ranks. Okay. Now, what you do is you assign 
our skill rank into a skill. You can have no more ranks in any particular skill than your class level, which is one. So you can only put one rank in any skill so far because you're only level one. Uh, on top of this, you also gain your intelligence modifier as skill, additional skill ranks. So you have two plus your intelligence modifier of four is seven. So you have a total of seven skill ranks uh, to distribute amongst various skills. Now, keep in mind, the more ranks you put in a skill, the better you are at it. But again, you can't have more ranks in a skill than your current character class level. You're one, so okay. only one rank per skill. Now, it's a good time to discuss what I talked about earlier before you jumped on. It's called class skills. These are skills particular to your class, in this case, mm -hmm. wizard. Uh, it inv there's a number of them. Most of them are knowledge skills uh but there's also spellcraft the spellcraft skill is very associated with the wizard class now you want to write these down there's eight of them yeah okay okay when you're ready yeah i'm ready no knowledge arcana okay knowledge dungeoneering Dungeoneering. It's basically exploring dungeon type atmospheres. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ian cracking jokes. Next is knowledge geography. Oh. I can see his wizard with a big wheelbarrow pushing around his giant spell book. <laughs> we sing, yeah? Squeaking along. <laughs> Quiet that elf down. Quiet. <clears throat> could happen. You could have like a little servant that pushes your wheelbarrow around that has your big giant tome of a spell book. That would be hilarious. I would, I would, I would get, I would get, I would get <laughs> a familiar get, or something. <laughs> I will get the, I will get the dwarf to do it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Hire a dwarf to do it. <clears throat> that could happen, folks. That would be hilarious. <clears throat> great role playing potential for that thank you ian see your magic my friend your magic all right wait a minute here we are you should have written down knowledge geography yep okay the next one is knowledge history oh, for god's sake too much knowledge <laughs> yep and that's a wizard for you they love this stuff mm -hmm. next is knowledge local l-o-c-a-l yeah. That's things like local backgrounds to the village or the yeah, where yeah, you're yeah. located. Something the locals would know. Local knowledge. <clears throat> Next, we have knowledge, nature. Okay. Ah, the workings of nature. Oh, yes. Next, you have knowledge, religion. You have some knowledge on religious type of topics. Yep. And finally, your eighth class skill is spellcraft. Now, these are what's known as class skills. You don't have them. To have them, they you have to either put a rank in them or it has to be a non-trained only skill. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't have these automatically. But if you do put ranks in them or they're not, trained only uh okay. you gain a bonus well actually i take that back i don't want to confuse you here if you put at least one rank in any of these eight skills yeah. you're gonna you're gonna gain a, a plus three bonus on top of everything else because you put a rank in it and it's a class skill you get a bonus mm -hmm. plus three automatically okay so kind of in parentheses next to this area of the record sheet next to these eight class skills put plus three okay. if you have a rank in it yeah if you have a rank in it, at least in that skill okay oh, i'm having a hard time describing that sorry folks how are you mrs <laughs> uh, a 
master crafted wheelbarrow. Tell Tellian, Tellian, Tellian. I will find him during the to, during the campaign, and my burning hands will go very close to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep pushing him off every cliff you find, and then just quickly throw feather fall on him. That's all. Just to mess him up in the head every time he goes near something cliff. Push him off and cast feather fall. And laugh. <laughs> like he'd, he'd be paranoid every time he goes around high places. <laughs> Yo, bastard! <laughs> As he slowly falls. <laughs> Is he on line? No, oh, he's he's listening to us. Ah, tell him, tell him to do me a favor. When he finds time, tell him to read the story I wrote uh, in the group about. Uh, the the elf so he can give me his opinion in my story writing did you post it in there yes you remember you read it from there from the group oh i thought it was email yeah you're right <clears throat> have a look have a look and let me know you are the master of history if you like my story i'll double check in a second to make sure he's in there i'm not sure if you posted that to the hinterlands campaign or the rpg adventure group i think to the hinterlands Campaign. If it's in there, I don't think he's in there. You know, I should add him in there. Maybe I already did. Let me do that right now, Ian. I'm going to double check. Yeah, and, and let him read my story. And let me tell me his opinion. He's the master of storytelling. Uh, yeah, let me. I don't, I don't think he's in there. There you go. You're added. It's our... You check on your Facebook, Ian. It's called The Hinterlands. It's a secret group. Uh, that only the players are actually privy to and in. I accidentally added Stefan and Paul Beckus and uh, Neil to it. I, I apologize for that and let them. They can. It's fine if they leave. I don't know. I'm not going to go into how that happened, but they're in there as well. They're not actually playing, but they're watching along. So, where is that? If you look in there, Ian, you'll find a post by Nick. Uh, a few days ago, a week ago, where he paid, posted a, a picture of his character and a description, or at least a description. A picture, and then bef uh, before the picture down, it's uh, like, say, the background I liked. Of course, the names maybe we have to change, but let him read it and tell me his opinion. I see your picture. It's Elnor Silverwater. Very nice. There it is. I will tag you. So you can read it. Ah, you find the story? Okay. <clears throat> You're tagged to the story, Ian. Elnor was a very tall, even, I misspelled elven, elf for an elf. Even all oh, very tall, even for an elf. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so we finished uh, the skills. This one. Uh, well, those are your class skills. You haven't actually chose any. Put your ranks okay. where you want them yet. So let's go to the skills section of this book here. All right, skills. Like I said, you're going to have uh, two because of your class with an additional plus four. Mm -hmm. Is it plus four? Your intelligence bonus? Uh, yes, it's plus four, yeah. Yeah, plus four. And two for your wizard class. So you have a total of six ranks. Okay. Okay. Basically, what a, what a rank is and why it's called a rank is it improves your skill with a skill. It improves your ability with a skill. Every rank is a plus one whenever you use that skill. So if you got plus three ranks in bluff, you're going to have a plus three on your die roll whenever you attempt to bluff somebody. Okay. Now, if it's a class skill, like those eight I gave you, on top of that, you get an additional <clears throat> automatic plus three. If you have at least one rank in it, you always get a plus three if it's a skill that your class is associated with. 
keep that in mind. As long as you have a rank in it, <clears throat> you get that plus three uh, for a class skill. Anyway, I know it's a little confusing, folks. I'm having a hell of a time describing it. <clears throat> uh, there's a ton of skills, and there's even more in the core rules. Uh, anybody could try a skill for the most part. A handful of skills are trained only. You can't do it unless you're actually got a rank in it. But most skills, you don't even have to put a rank in to be able to attempt it. Like diplomacy. Anybody could be attempt to convince somebody of something. Uh, anybody could attempt to, uh, let me find one that makes sense, ride an animal, for instance, or do tricks on a horse. Anybody could try it. Perception. Anybody could try and spot something in a crowded room. Anybody could try that. It's a skill. But if you put ranks in it, you're you're better at it than someone who doesn't have ranks in it. So that's the whole idea of ranks. Some skills, like spellcraft, are trained only. You have to put a rank in it to ever attempt it. The common Joe off the street is knows nothing about spellcraft. They're going to automatically fail. They can't even attempt anything with it. Uh, Knowledge skills are trained only. All the knowledge skills. Unless you're trained in it, put a rank in it, you have no knowledge skill in something like Arcana or Dungeoneering or Geography or History, Local, Nature, Religion, etc. Got to put a rank in it to know about it. So let me see here. You're going to have six ranks to distribute. Now, the way this works in the game, Nick, is that you have a character sheet, and on your character sheet, it actually lists all the skills in the game for you. And if you put a rank in it, there's a space to put that. There's a space to put how many ranks you put in each skill. Uh, it also has a space for your ability score modifier that applies to that skill, as well as a space for miscellaneous modifiers like the racial elven uh, ability of plus two to your perception checks that's a skill uh, that would be put under miscellaneous and there's a column for total total where you total all these modifiers together whenever you use that skill and i'll show you what that looks like mm -hmm. uh, okay yep yeah. So you'd look at each skill, like for instance, there you've got climb. And if you read across, it'll tell you how many ranks you have in it, whether or not mm -hmm. it's a, a class, a skill, you'd put an X in this first box. Mm -hmm. uh, and modifiers for the ability score, mm -hmm. uh, like for climb, it's strength. If you have a strength bonus, you'd put it here. It'd be a plus yeah. zero for you. And the last column is your total. All those modifiers are totaled. So it's easy mm -hmm. to find and calculate. So whenever you use climb, you just look at that total box and, and that's your model. Yeah. yeah. But this is what it looks like and it covers all the skills for you. And it's all very well organized. If you can print out this record sheet, I highly I recommend it. I will, I will, uh, I will, I will on, uh, on Saturday, tomorrow, after tomorrow, yes. So I don't, I don't think we should just manually write this down. We could if okay. you want. No, no issue. I, I will do it with, with you when I print the paper, the PDF. Let me look here. And that way, well, you know, we could go over the skills and tell me which ones you want to put ranks in. Can you well, tell me, uh, uh, Kurt, I haven't understood yet, because when you mean ranks, what do you mean ranks? What What is the ranks? To put that, uh, what is exactly? Ranks is... The more ranks you put in a skill, all right, the better you are at that skill. Every rank is a plus one on your die roll when you attempt the skill. How many ranks do I have to, I can put now? I mean, um, how do you determine the ranks? I mean, uh, I can put a rank to every skill? No. No. You start the game off based on your class, it gives you two ranks. Ah, okay. Okay. I get plus that. your intelligence modifier. Okay, plus four, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Ah, so, so I can put at seven skills ranks. Well, six. Four plus two is six. Uh, six, sorry, yeah, yeah. No. So you have six. 
<laughs> six ranks available. You can't okay. put more than one rank in a skill. Uh, yeah. The limit is your class level. You're level one. You can't put any more ranks in a class. Just one. So I can put ranks in basically six skills now. Yeah. Okay. So you choose six skills that are uh, interest, interesting to you. Now keep in mind, if you put a rank in a class of skill, you're going to get a bonus plus three. Yeah. On top of can, all this. I, yeah. I can, I can put also in the class skill one, huh? Yeah. Like, for instance, spellcraft. That's a class skill for a wizard. If you put one rank in there, you're going to get a plus one for the rank, and you're going to get a plus three because you put a rank in a class skill. And this plus four that I will get gives me what extra for my spellcraft? It gives me something extra? Yeah, it, it improves your chance of success. Like if you wanted to attempt to identify a potion, like what is this potion, this green liquid in this, this vial? What is this? Oh, I know. I'm going to use my spellcraft skill. All right. You use your spellcraft skill and you tell the GM you're going to do so. And then you roll your d20. And then you're going to add all your modifiers to that roll. In your case, it would be, it would be a plus three because you have a rank and a class skill, and a plus one because you have a rank in it, so it's plus four total. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. And on top of that, you'd get a plus four because your intelligence modifier. So you'd have yeah. a four plus a four. You'd have a plus eight on your die roll. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Which is pretty good. That's what yeah. wizards are good at. Yeah. <clears throat> That's pretty good. D20 plus eight. That's a plus, plus one for the ranks, plus three because it's a class skill you put ranks in, and then a plus four because of your intelligence mod. Total, plus eight. So you roll D20 and add plus eight. Let's see. I'll roll D20 here. You got 13, 40, 50, 60, 70, 18, 19, 20, 21. You scored a 21 on your die roll. Now let's say that the game master decided that the the difficulty class of your test was a 15. If you scored a 15 or greater, you have success. You identified yeah. the potion in this case, even yeah. the caster level of the potion. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Modifiers are good. You want modifiers. And that's how spellcraft would work for you. It's it's a trained only skill, so and it's also a class skill that you would have. So I, I recommend it as a skill you put it one rank in. Yeah. Let us check the others also. Okay. And we can put Do you want to put a rank in that? Uh, let me see the, the the others also. You told me we have a couple more that we can choose from. Yeah, go through the whole thing. It's we too much. have. If it's too much, I can check it on my own. No problem. Not too much at all. I'm going to give them all okay. to you. How about swimming? That's a skill. You want to be good at swimming? All right. There's swimming. Next yeah. is stealth. This is where you're good at sneaking up on people, sneaking around, hiding in the shadows like a rogue. Yes. All right. Yeah. Next is sense motive. This is where you're able to tell whether somebody's lying to you. Like if they're using a bluff skill or something on you, yeah. If they're lying, you can, that's what sense motive is. What is this guy up to? I'm going to use a sense motive skill tech check, check here and see what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Sense motive. Next is ride. You're good at riding animals, guiding animals, uh, leaping across uh, gaps with a, on a horse or something. Mm -hmm. Let me let me check something here. I think this might be really helpful right now. Skills, wizard class suggestions. This is what I should be reading to you. Choose skills from this list in order until you run out of ranks. This is what the book suggests for a wizard. Knowledge Arcana, put a rank in it. Spellcraft, put a rank in it. Knowledge Dungeoneering, put a rank in it. Knowledge Geography. Knowledge history, knowledge local, yeah. and knowledge nature. Yeah. That's what it suggests for a beginning player. And yeah. I would agree. Those are knowledge is a, a very important skill to have 
for a wizard, especially since they're trained only skills, which means it's likely that unless there's another wizard or cleric in the party, uh, they're not going to have any knowledge skills, but you yeah. will. So let's look at the knowledge skills and see if you like them enough to put ranks in these skills. You use your knowledge to answer simple and complex questions. The knowledge skill is actually seven different knowledge skills, but the rules for them all work the same. You treat the knowledge skills as different skills when putting ranks in them. For example, having a rank in Arcana doesn't give you a bonus on history. Check your class to determine which ones are class skills for you. We already went over that. Now, Knowledge Arcana. Basically, it covers the topics of arcane symbols, constructs, dragons, magical beasts. You would be knowledgeable in those topics. Good to know. Dungeoneering is all about aberrations and caverns and oozes and slimes, things common in the underdark, the underworld, dungeon type of atmosphere. You'd know about these topics. Geography, of course, is all about climate, lands, people, and terrain. History is all about colonies, exploration, founding of cities and wars and great conflicts of the past. Next is local. That's local knowledge about humanoids, laws, legends, personalities, heroes, villains, traditions that are commonly known amongst the local people of an area. Next is nature. And that covers topics about animals, monstrous, monstrous humanoids, plants, vermin, weather, things of that nature. And finally, religion. Gods and goddesses, holy symbols, relics, mythic history, and the undead. Mm. So you have, those are all class skills for you. Arcana, engineering, geography, history, local nature, religion. You could put ranks in any of those and gain an additional bonus of plus three whenever you use them. You're a wizard. You're a brainy type of guy with a big fat book all the time. Happens to be an elf. Yep. Uh, let me. Kaching. But can we check also the other skills so I can see if I like any of them? Definitely. Uh, it also recommends spellcraft, which I also recommend for a wizard. Uh, let's go through some more acrobatics. Do you want to be good at flipping around and running up slippery steps and that kind of thing? Could save your life. It would. Another one is jumping. That's literally jumping either up great distances or across, vertical or horizontal. It's, you know, the better you are at jumping, the further you can jump. Like if there's a 10-foot gap between you and your friends, for whatever reason, a pit opened up, you might be able to attempt a jump skill and get across the damn thing. Okay. Put a rank in it, you gain a bonus. In this case, it would be plus one per rank. Uh, all kinds of modifiers would apply to that, though. All right, next is bluff. You use bluff to tell lies successfully. If someone thinks you're lying, he can attempt a sense motive check. Ooh, so it's a skill versus skill. If your bluff check beats his sense motive check, you convince him that your what you were saying is true. Telling a lie takes as long as it takes to say the lie, usually a round or more. If the person doesn't believe you, he, you take a minus 10 penalty to bluff him a second time after that. <clears throat> so bluffing, that's your ability to trick people with lies. Yeah. Next is climbing. That's where you're good at climbing trees, slippery surfaces, whenever you want to use your climb check. That would what you'd do it for. Yeah. Uh, it also, you can also attempt it if you're falling and there's a chance of grabbing the sides of something, you know, to catch your fall. Like if you're falling down a tall tree, you can attempt a climb check to try and grab a limb or something to keep you from falling. <clears throat> so again, if you put a rank in it, you'll be better at that skill. <coughs> yeah. 
<clears throat> Next is diplomacy. That's your ability to persuade people uh, to agree with you, to resolve differences, or to gather valuable information or rumors from people. Like, for instance, let's say that you and your friends, they've just recently entered a small village. Uh, you've been tracking some villainous creatures for the past couple weeks. Uh, your character, the elf, decides, you know what, guys? I'm going to head to the local <coughs> tavern and try and pick up some information and, and see if anybody knows anything about the whereabouts of these people we're tracking. Basically, what would go on here is you would go to the tavern and use a diplomacy check. If it's successful enough, you might find out a lot of information about the guys you're following, if there's information to be found. If you fail it, you probably won't find out anything. But that's how that works. That's how diplomacy can be used in the game. Yeah, in Influencing people, finding out information, so on and so forth. Anybody could attempt diplomacy. It's not a class or a trained only skill, I should say. Uh, next is disable device. It's a trained only skill. Mm -hmm. uh, rogues would have this skill. Okay. Uh, I cannot do this. Yeah. No, you can do it. You can take whatever you ah. want. It's just trained only. You can't use it unless you do put a rank in it. That's what it's what it okay. is. It's like disabling traps or things like that <clears throat> uh opening locks uh next we have heal this is a skill you use your heal to perform surgery treat disease and poison save the dying and help injured people recover okay you can stabilize a dies a dying friend that kind of thing it's extremely useful anybody can use it uh, next, we have knowledge, which we went over. Next, yeah. we have perception. Uh, you use perception to spot traps. Notice someone is sneaking up on you. Hear a faint sound in the distance. Taste poison in food, and so on. You don't have to spend an action to use perception unless you're actively searching for something. Searching a five-foot square area, for instance, is considered a move action. So perception is used a lot in our game sessions. Uh, if you just walk into a room and I think there's something you might notice, like whispering in the distance, I'll secretly make a perception check for everybody in the group that I think could possibly hear it. And yeah. if your character does hear it, I'll say so. But that's an example of what I call passive perception. Uh, you're not actively attempting to hear anything it's just yeah you notice it or you don't but you can actively also do it like richard in one of our last games he actively did a perception check he uh went up to a partially open stuck door in a dungeon and he purposely stuck his head through the door and listened very carefully in the distance what could be heard and that was simply a perception test uh so it's a very useful very commonly used skill in the game perception okay. Yeah. Next, we have ride. Uh, it's your ability to guide animals uh, through uh, tricky areas or to leap things, do tricks, you know, simple things. Ride various mm -hmm. animals and steeds in the game, whether it's horses or whatever. Uh, next one is sense motive. We went through that before. Yeah. Uh, if someone is attempting a bluff skill on you, you could use the sense motive skill against it. <clears throat> If your score is higher than his, you sense that he's lying to you and vice versa. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it's your ability to tell what people are saying to you if they're lying or not. Next, we have spellcraft. We went over that. Next is stealth. We went over that. Yeah, we, we'll go the way. Yeah. Swim, and that's it. Okay. Now, I will choose... <clears throat> I will put for sure one rank to stealth. Are right, you putting one rank in the stealth skill? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will put one in spellcraft for sure. Okay. One in uh, knowledge arcana. Okay. One in engineering. Okay. 
So we'll have one, two, three, four. I have another three. Uh, two. I would, two. One, two, three, uh, six. Okay, sorry. Uh, I will put one to uh, to uh, um, let me think one second. I will put one to uh, local. Knowledge local. Yeah. And um, my final one will be um, uh, will be. Um, let us be a bit more athletic. Jumping. There you go. Who jumping skill? That's good. All right, and every rank gives you a plus one on your die roll. Um, yep. And if it's a class skill, you got a rank in it, you get an additional plus three. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's your ability score modifier that adds to it as well, like jumping its dexterity. Whatever your dex mod yep. is, you'll add that to, to the roll. So kind of organized on your paper for these, what is it, eight or one, two, three, four, six skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, right next to it, right next to the name, put rank one. Yeah, yeah, okay. And next to that, put the ability score bonus. Now, I'll tell you what they are. Stealth is dexterity. So whatever your dexterity modifier is, put that there. Let's see. It's right. uh, dexterity is plus, my dexterity is uh, plus uh, 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 three. Got it. All right. Stealth will be plus three for dex. Now, all of your knowledge skills are intelligence based. So you get a plus yeah. four for your intelligence modifier on all of those. So, Bellcraft, uh, local. Uh, the engineering and arcana, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Wait a minute. Knowledge. Uh, jumping Spe the last one. Wait, wait a minute here. Spellcraft. That's a separate skill. It's not knowledge. That's uh, intelligence. Okay. Intelligence, I have four. All right. I'm sorry. I, I thought that you were talking knowledge, arcana. Knowledge, spellcraft. There isn't one. That's my... Oh, dexterity. Head. Dexterity, yeah. Okay. Uh, all your knowledge skills are intelligence okay based so you'll add your intelligence modifier uh, jumping is dexterity you'll add your dexterity modifier to your jumping skill plus three plus three very good I chose with my high uh, very good <laughs> and you have class skill bonuses on all of these except mm -hmm. stealth mm-hmm now the class class bonus is uh, plus three. So plus three to spellcraft, plus three to arcana, dungeoneering, local, and that's it. You don't get it for jumping and you don't get it for stealth. Okay. Those aren't class skills for the wizard. <clears throat> They're not known for being great jumpers or stealthy types, so they don't get that. And of course you get the number of ranks you put in all these skills as an additional plus one. Plus so, one, yeah. Let's take an example. Let's say you're using uh, knowledge arcana during a, an adventure. Let's say you want to yes. use that skill. Well, yeah. we can see right away that it's an intelligence-based skill, which you have a plus four with. You also have a rank in it, which is a plus one. It mm -hmm. also is a class skill for a wizard, and you have at least one rank in it. So that's mm -hmm. four plus three plus one. Yep. Yeah. Eight, yeah. Plus eight whenever you use that knowledge skill, Arcana. Mm -hmm. Now, by contrast, all right, let's say you attempt to do a knowledge skill that you don't have a rank in. Let's say religion. You didn't put any ranks in knowledge religion. Now, mm -hmm. your chance of being successful with that is nil because you it's a trained only skill you've yeah. got to study in it you got to study to know be able to use it now yeah. let's try something else entirely let's try uh 
acrobatics. Let's say you're trying to do some fancy footwork and, and jump up on a chandelier from a high ledge. Okay. Yeah. That would be an acrobatics check. That's a dexterity skill. Anybody can attempt it. So you don't have to, it's not trained only. You could do this yeah. even if you don't have ranks in it. It's a dexterity uh, based skill. So you're going to add your dexterity modifier, which is uh, uh, what my dexterity is uh, plus three. <clears throat> do you have ranks in it? No, you don't get that. No. Is it a class skill you have ranks in? No, don't have that either. No. Do you have any other racial or miscellaneous modifiers that can help you with acrobatics? No. No. Only so you're only adding plus three to your role. Mm -hmm. And let's let's see, you're trying to jump a 10 foot uh, space. The difficulty of that is like a 10. All you have to do is score a 10 or greater. You wouldn't know this. Yeah. I would keep it secret. But you'd roll yeah. d20, add plus three in this case. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, plus roll. one because I put ranks also, I think. Oh, and jumping? Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. You did. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm a jumping wizard. All right. Wait a minute. I'm getting confused here because jumping is a separate skill. I thought. No, that's that's my fault. It's acrobatics. All right, wait a minute. You put a you put a rank in jumping. It should be acrobatics. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Okay, it's the same. Uh, it's acrobatics. Okay, no problem. Yes, it's, acrobatics. it's much more broad in what you can do with it. I don't know why I was looking at jumping. No problem. Okay, sorry. So again, acrobatics skill. You have a rank in it, and it's dexterity based, which is plus three for you. So a total of plus four whenever you attempt to do that. Anything to do with acrobatics, like jumping, that's only one thing you can do it. You can also do it, use it to balance on small uh, things like a wire, like a clown or something. <laughs> Very <laughs> on good. A, on a ledge, you know, fight a battle on a one foot wide ledge, a hundred feet Fantastic. above ground. That's what you'd use acrobatics for. Very good. So you have a plus four on that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, all these other skills that aren't trained only, you also can use, okay? Yeah. It's not just these six skills you gave me here. You you can use yeah. all of them that aren't trained only, like heal. You can always do that. Diplomacy, uh, sense motive, bluff, ride, perception checks, stealth, which you do actually have a rank in. Uh, and swim. You could always attempt these things anyway. You just don't have any ranks in them. So there's no plus one to it. Uh, it'd just be a straight roll plus the ability modifier, whatever it is. Stealth is dex. Swim is strength. Perception is wisdom. Ride is dexterity. Sense motive is wisdom. Whatever your modifier for that ability is, you'll add yeah. whenever you attempt to do it. Okay. Let me check the chat here. Oh, la, 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 I am not in hinterlands. I, I added you, uh, Ian, so you can see that. Ranks are like pips that add to your skills. Uh, ranks are like a modifier. One rank is a plus one. So if you put a rank in something, you're getting a, basically you're getting a plus one. Uh, it's basically a way of saying it's a measure of your skill. If you put more ranks than the other guy in a particular skill, you're better than him. You get more modifiers. Good. They call them ranks. Uh, the only restriction is that you can't put ranks, more ranks in a skill than your class level. Like if I was a fifth level fighter, I could never put more than five ranks in any skill. But that said, if I had five ranks in a skill, that would be a plus five on my die roll. If it's a class skill, that's an additional plus three, uh, plus whatever my, my ability score modifier was. Let's say strength. Maybe my strength is a plus four. So it's four plus five plus, plus uh, uh, three. Uh, my math is getting crazy here, but you get the idea. 
you know, that's how you get pretty good at stuff. It's like, okay, roll D20. I need a 10 or greater. Oh, let's see. I got a plus 50 on the roll. Cripes. You can fail with an automatic roll of one. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can't gain any knowledge pushing this bloody big tome around in my wheelbarrow. <laughs> that lazy elf. <laughs> I can see it now. I can see this character developing, Ian. This is great. This also, is I swear to God, bring him, bring him, bring him in the campaign. I will you know, crush him. It, it would. <laughs> don't, don't crush him. She's going to be a little dwarf. Or better yet, a little gnome. A gnome would be perfect. Yeah. A, little be, a little gnome, a little gnome from the north. I have to show you pictures of these characters. Gnomes are cool. Uh, anyway, let me see. But I can lift heavy things and wave my chopper around. Uh, Ian says, so you run, a, you run up a slippery slope for a jump, then lie your way out of it. Climb out of the <coughs> lady's room, but grab her skirt and, to save you. Persuade her husband you were there to read the gas mirror. Yes, yes, yes. You can do all those things. And usually there's dice rolls involved to see how successful or how good you are or how badly you failed at these things. That's what makes it pretty cool. You can do all that stuff. High wire, hot wire, hot wire his car to make your getaway. Self heal your nasty itch. <laughs> An embarrassing place. You can easily find the itch and hear some bugger whispering in the next cubicle. All that and more. Uh, that's great. <laughs> oh, I will be waiting for you with my long stuff, my friend. Yep, the, the masterwork. <laughs> the masterwork uh, whip. <laughs> Plus one to hit, baby. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go into the final phase before we buy equipment. We can handle that uh, in a minute. But feats. Feats are special tricks that you know or talents for doing certain things that are you're better than others at doing. They're little unique things to set you apart, your character apart. They make you stand out. Uh, all first level characters begin with only a single feat. Now, as you gain levels in the game, you'll be able to gain more feats. I think the next one comes at third level. Uh, a third feat comes at a fifth and so on. Uh, but you only start the game with one. Humans, of course, gain an additional feat, but you're not human, you're just an elf. There's no bonuses to this, just one feat. Now, most feats have prerequisites. In other words, you gotta be a certain class to pick it, or you need at least a dexterity of 15 or a strength of 13, or there's requirements to be able to choose it. Yeah. Now, I'll go through these, tell you what the bonuses are for taking them. Uh, I can take one? You can only take one. Okay. Let me see if you, this is available to you. Let's see. Acrobatic steps. Prerequisite, dexterity 15. Do you have dexterity 15? I have... Uh, one second. Yes, I have dexterity uh, 16. You do. So this is something you can choose. It's called acrobatic steps. Uh, For God's sake, I, if I get more acrobatics, I'll become uh, uh, Houdini. <laughs> there you go. Here's what it does. I'm just going to read it real quick because it's interesting. You can move through up to 15 feet of difficult terrain, you know, brush, things to get in the way. Uh, even a crowded room, that would be difficult terrain. Uh, 15 feet through difficult terrain per round as if it was normal terrain. This is in addition to the five foot five feet allowed to the nimble moves feet oh i'm sorry you have to have nimble moves feet first all right skip that you can't have it i don't want to if i take any more acrobatics i will become david copperfield all right well let me ask you this is there something special you would like your wizard to be good at like improved initiative maybe he's really fast maybe he's good at dodging arrows and things or uh maybe he has lightning reflexes he gets a plus one on his initiative roll uh, you are a wizard, so you can only pick wizard ones. All right, no cleave. You can't pick that. Uh, combat expertise. 
You need intelligence 13. I have uh, 18. The picture next to the feet names show what classes that feet is good for. Use them to help make your choice. All right, so it's not a requirement. All right, combat expertise. You need intelligence 13. Anybody could anybody could take it, but mostly it's wizards and rogues that would take this. Or not wizards, fighters and rogues. Yeah. You're good I, at it. I, I, I like this. I like this. I will take this one. I want to become eventually a wizard warrior. All right. The benefit is when you use this feat, you gain a plus one bonus to your armor class until the start of your next turn. If this is what you have in mind, you can take it. Uh, when you use this feat, you take a minus one penalty on melee attack rolls until the start of your next turn. Uh, if you're a fourth level fighter, the armor class bonus increases to plus two and the melee attack penalty increases by minus two. That's if you're a fighter. If you're a fighter. Yeah, this is Anything something else? more this is something more associated with a fighter. Are you sure you want to take it? No, no, let's continue a couple more if you have any other. Okay. Deadly aim, dexterity 13, and you need an attack bonus of plus one. Your attack bonus <clears throat> is zero. You can't take it. Yeah, I cannot. <clears throat> Next is dodge. This is available to everybody. You just need a dexterity of 13. You gain a plus one bonus to your armor class. If you lose your dexterity bonus to armor class, for example, if you're paralyzed or you're tied up, you lose the plus one armor class bonus for this feat. So it basically gives you an additional armor class bonus. Now, armor class is your the difficulty it is to hit you. The more armor you wear, the higher your dexterity score, the higher your armor class. Yeah. This feat gives you an additional plus one to your armor class. Makes you harder to hit. Yeah. All right. What's this called? It's called dodge. Okay. And it's not something you do. It's just something that automatically you have. Yeah. It's instinct uh, that makes you dodge out of the way and give you an extra bonus to your plus one. It's just something you do. Next is fleet. No prerequisite. Anybody can take this. While you are wearing light or no armor at all, your base speed increases by five feet. Your base speed is 30 feet. Yours, yeah. would, yours would become 35 feet if you're in light armor or no more armor at all, which is likely for a wizard. You can yeah. choose this feat multiple times, which increases your speed five feet each time you choose that feat. You only start with one feat, so you won't get another one until level three. <clears throat> yeah. But you can take it a second time when you reach level, uh, level three. So that's something to keep in mind. It's called fleet, F-L-E-E-T. Next, we have no prerequisite for this one. It's called great fortitude. You get a plus two bonus on all fortitude savings throws. That's a constitution-based savings throw. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's for clerics. Uh, uh, is there any feat that I'm very fast? <clears throat> uh, here's one called... Let me see. I have to skip ahead here and find it. Uh, where are you? Lightning reflexes. It's available to everybody. You get a plus two bonus on all reflex savings throws. That's one that makes you pretty quick. Here's one called nimble moves. You need a dexterity 13. Whenever you move, you may move through five feet of difficult terrain each round as if it were normal terrain. This means that difficult terrain only costs you five feet of movement instead of 10. Yeah. Next, we have Quick Draw. You need an attack bonus of plus one. You don't have that. You have a zero. Mm -hmm. uh, rapid Reload. The re requisite here is proficiency with the crossbow type. <coughs> some type of crossbow. You choose which type. And you have, uh, you are good with crossbows because you're a, 
I think it's because your wizard, I think your wizard class allows you to use crossbows. Yeah, yeah, heavy crossbow and light crossbows. Yeah, so you could choose rapid reload for something like your heavy crossbow. Basically, pick either heavy crossbow or light crossbow. If you picked heavy crossbow, you can reload it as a move action. If you pick light crossbow, you can reload it as a free action. It's pretty quick. You can choose this feat multiple times in the future, uh, but you have to pick a different type of crossbow each time. So that's rapid reload. Next we have weapon finesse. No prerequisite. When making a melee attack, say with your knife, with a light weapon or a repair, better yet, a repair, you're, prof you're familiar with repairs, you may yeah. use your dexterity mod instead of your strength mod on the attack roll. Think about that. Yeah. Your, your strength modifier to attack is plus zero. Yeah. Your dex mod is a plus three. So if you want to use a dagger close in or any light weapon that you're that you can use that you're familiar with, you'll bet you'll get to use your dexterity bonus instead of strength. And how do you call this? This is called weapon finesse. Okay. It basically allows you with a melee attack to use your light weapon or repair <coughs> with your dex mod instead of your strength. Now, to clarify, normally in melee combat, your attack roll is modified by your strength modifier. When you make missile attacks, in other words, with a bow or a crossbow, or you're throwing a javelin or an axe, those attack rolls are modified by your dex modifier. Now, in the case of weapon finesse, this allows uh, the person with weapon finesse to make their melee attack rolls with their dex modifier instead. Very useful if you're a wizard. Very useful if you're a, a, a ranged type of fighter, like you like to throw things and use bows. Well, this lets you use light weapons and repairs and stuff uh, with your dex mod in melee. You don't have to throw them. So it's yeah. pretty useful. In your case, Nick, it would be a plus three. As opposed okay, to I will use this. One. I like it. I can. It can help me also uh, to have uh, some melee attacks. Okay, it's it's a useful, useful. It's logical. Yeah. It's a useful feat if you ever get caught in melee. Yeah, yeah. Because in if combat breaks out in the game, you're very likely to avoid melee. Don't get in melee. You don't want to be in melee. You could die in one shot. Yeah. But if it happens and you do have the a chance to attack first, you got weapon finesse. Use a light weapon or dagger or repair, uh, and boom, you get that plus three dexterity bonus to hit. Yeah, I would, I would take this feat. Yeah, I would take this. Mm. Well, let me go through some others. Here's, a, here's another one that might be considerable. <clears throat> it's called toughness. No prerequisite. Your total number of hit points increases by plus three. In other words, if you take the toughness feat, you automatically get a plus three to your hit points. Mm -hmm. Right now you're at seven. Yeah. This would pump you up to 10. Mm -hmm. All right, that's worth a consideration. Yeah, uh, now here's something really useful for wizards really useful no prerequisite but wizards really benefit from this it's the simple weapon proficiency in other words you are trained in all simple weapons you are able to use all simple weapons in combat only wizards can take this feat keep that in mind mm -hmm. if you don't have proficiency in a weapon you suffer a minus four penalty on your attack rolls with it well if you take this, you're suddenly proficient in all simple weapons. Now, to give you an idea here of simple weapons, they are clubs, daggers, darts, heavy crossbows, heavy maces, javelins, light crossbows, light maces, quarter staffs, short spears, slings, spears, and unarmed striking, punching people in the head. 
Yeah, I'm good at this in real life. Anyway. Those are all simple weapons. Okay. It's it's worth considering if you want to have more variety in the weapons you can choose from. I mean, your mm -hmm. class and your race gives you a few very select choices. Yeah. Uh, but if you're not pro proficient in weapon otherwise, it's a minus four to hit. That hurts. Yeah. But weapon finesse gives you something extra also. Weapon finesse gives you, it allows you to use your dexterity in melee. Yeah, okay, okay. But again, you, if you're not proficient, you would have a minus, huh? Yeah, you would have a minus four on top of that if you're not proficient in the weapon you're using. Uh, let's do this, yeah. Let's do this. It sounds good. So I can have some weapon proficiency. Yeah, I like it. All right, so you want you want to take that simple weapon proficiency? Yeah, yeah. I recommend it because it's only available to wizards. So it's like, yeah. yeah, there's your there's something that would be really useful for you. Yeah, yeah. If I if I if I if I get myself to melee, and my dwarf friends cannot do anything because they're too short, I will uh, have to defend myself. You know, Ian, you should join the game anyway because I, I really like when you're in the chat talking to these things. You'd have a blast. I should just bring you in. You're learning how to play. You know, I might as well let you create a character with us. Uh, boom, you're in. That would be great. Did he read my 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 uh, about the character? I think he. I think he was gonna read it. Oh, for God's sake, he's slower than a dwarf. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's all of his skills summed up. Yeah. Ah, so we found very well. Uh, Richard says, nice addition to the party. Uh, all right, let me write this down. You, your skill is going to be simple weapon proficiency. Mm -hmm. This is your, or not skill, this is your feat. Sorry. Yeah. Simple weapon proficiency. Now in the game, all the weapons are categorized as either simple, martial, exotic weapons they all fall into a category to help you know what am i trained in well what this tells us this feat, is it tells us that your character is proficient in all simple weapons so that's why it's called simple weapon there's there's categories that everything falls in and simple weapons is one of them uh fighters are good with all weapons including martial weapons so they have a lot more choices like martial weapons includes things like battle axes and great axes, great swords, light, ha light, light hammers, long bows, long swords, war hammers, throwing axes, star knives, short bows, short swords, scimitars, rapiers. And you'll notice that some of those weapons, your character is also proficient in simply because of his race. Nice. Long sword. Yes. Rapier, yeah. uh, long so, sword. So if I use a long sword, I don't get a minus bonus, correct? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Very good. I love the long sword. There you go. You got one, my friend. You were trained as a youth in the skills of the of long course. sword. Very good. While 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 I was burning the forest, experimenting. <laughs> yeah, with your evocation spells, burning things down, chasing dwarves away, and everything else. The terror of the forest. He's no. I hate. I hate dwarves. <laughs> and gnomes <laughs> include gnomes <clears throat> uh ian did reply uh looks like i may have a have to duck when he gets his big crossbow out yes you don't, you don't need to, you need you, ian my friend you don't need to duck you're too short anyway yeah well he he, he read your thing he said it was complete shite uh no only kid <laughs> he loved it <laughs> it's pretty good Nick. <laughs> Complete shite, gibberish. <laughs> what a good friend he is. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, Ian. My my French knights are waiting for you in Bourget. Wait, my wait. Battle awaits. So there's your feats and your skills and. We're going to finalize this by going into equipment. Now, as a starting wizard, you start the game off with 70 gold pieces. So write that down. Yeah. 
I have to come up with a better name than gold pieces. That's very generic. But for now, we're calling it gold pieces. The campaign actually has a name for them, Richard. I, I haven't looked it up. There's actually names for them, like crown. <coughs> or something. But gold pieces works for now. Okay. Uh, now, normally what you do is you spend uh, some of this money. You don't usually spend it all on things that you want your character to have right from the get-go. Now, if we remember, you automatically start with that Mastercraft uh, quarter staff. You, you have that. You could, <laughs> you could fight with that if you want. You could beat up the dwarf with it if you want. Uh, yes, very easily. And since you're proficient in simple weapons, you don't suffer a penalty to do so. Mm. So you'll get a plus That's one. Very you'll get a plus one because it's Mastercraft to hit, and you'll also get a plus uh, whatever strength modifier is, zero. Uh, I think it's zero. Yeah. Right. It's not a light weapon, so you wouldn't gain the... Well, that's a different feat. What am I thinking? Uh, oh, you couldn't use your dexterity. No. I, thought, I thought you took that feat. You didn't. So No, we didn't. You just won't suffer the minus four to hit with it. <clears throat> very good uh but keep in mind you're not a melee fighter so it's something still something to avoid uh i gotta stop saying uh what you do at this point is you usually spend that 70 coins some of it at least on things like adventuring gear uh, equipment mm. weapons armor things you might find useful don't spend everything <coughs> because until you know what your situation is in the, uh, yeah, the yeah. campaign so far you, you save your money for buying special things uh you can buy things like uh antitoxins backpacks bed rolls belt pouches holy water holy symbol flint and steel crowbars chalk so you don't get lost in places like dungeons candles <clears throat> you could buy horses lanterns spell books let me see this a spell book has 100 pages each spell takes up one page. If you are a wizard, you start the game with a spell book containing all the spells you know. And you must have your spell book to prepare your spells. So you come with this automatically. If you wanted yeah. to buy one, typically they're about 15 gold pieces. Okay. Uh, other things are torches, trail rations, water skins, thieves' tools. Uh, books, <coughs> lanterns, mirrors, if you want to look around corners, uh, flint and steel for for lighting torches. Yeah. Well, I will buy when I start the campaign, but I need uh, clothes I have, I suppose. You have clothes. Let me see here. I think there's a... One thing I do recommend you buy right away, it's called an adventurer's kit. And just write it down, adventurer's kit. It's seven okay. gold pieces. Mm -hmm. And it has a whole bunch of stuff in it that you don't have to worry about buying again. Okay. And I'll I fill you. I'll I'll fill you in if you want. If you want to write this down now, be my guest. Yeah, I'm right. It is it is a bundle of gear which includes all the basic equipment that most adventurers need: a backpack. Condoms. Condoms. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A bedroll. A belt pouch, a sack, okay. a set of clothes, simple clothes, you know, tunic, pants, vest, footwear, mm -hmm. <clears throat> 10 torches, very useful, mm -hmm. five days worth of trail rations. And a water skin, which can hold wine or ale or water, any liquid you can dream of. About a half yeah. gallon. But it's it's a water skin, half gallon water skin. You okay. get all that stuff for seven gold pieces. I got it. Okay, I will get 663 now, balance. Got it. Uh, <sighs> plus you have the spell book. Write that down. Yes. Uh, let me see here. You got a backpack. You don't need to buy that. Bedroll, clothes. Really, most of the other things are very 
specific? I need to see how the campaign goes and what I will do to buy. I will keep the money. A horse is typically 75 gold pieces. Also, keep in mind that not everything will always be available. Yeah. Uh, you want you want animals and horses and stuff like that. You got to go to the the usually where they sell them. You know, you got to look around town for these things. They're not just in yeah. one big mega mall. There's also weapons and armor. Armor you might as well ignore uh, for the moment anyway. And simple yeah. weapons you can choose. Like I said, you do have a masterwork quarter staff. That's a, technically a weapon. Uh, there are light crossbows, which cost, I'll give you an idea what they cost if you want to buy one. 35 gold pieces, typically, a light crossbow. No. A heavy crossbow is 50 gold pieces. No. Uh, a spear is two gold pieces. A dagger is two gold pieces. Now keep How in much mind, is a long sword? A long sword. How much is a long sword? Long sword is 15 gold pieces. Okay. I'm proficient at this, correct? I don't get a minus. Because of your race? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A three and a half foot long sword. <clears throat> and when we get into combat, we'll go over what these things mean. But it's basically a melee only weapon. Its cost is 15 gold pieces. It's used with one hand but you can use it with two hands and get a bonus on your two hit. It's a slashing weapon as opposed to bludgeoning or piercing. Uh, some opponents are more vulnerable to certain types of attacks. This is a slashing attack. It does 1d8 damage when you hit. In other words, if you hit, roll 1d8, add your, add your strength modifier, that's the total damage you do. Okay, I get it. And it, in this game also uses what's called critical hits. In the case of a longsword, if you roll a natural 19 or 20 on your, on your d20, if you roll 19 or 20 before modifiers, you, you get what is called a critical threat. And what a critical threat means is you get to roll a d20 again. And if you hit, if you hit with it, you do a critical hit, basically double damage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Weapon, different weapons have different critical threat numbers. Uh, typically, it's a 20, but in the case of the longsword, it's a 19 <clears throat> or a 20 if it's a natural result of 19 or 20. Yeah. Uh, for instance, the light light hammer mm -hmm. has a threat range of 20. So if it rolls a 20 on its D20 attack roll, it does a critical threat. Rolls again, if it hits, it does double damage. Yep. That said, some weapons do more than double damage with a critical hit. Some do three times damage, like a longbow uh, or a star knife, things like that, or a great axe. They'll, they triple their damage with a critical hit. Uh, so, yeah. Every weapon has unique little traits associated with it. Now, if you use a one-handed weapon with two ha two wet two hands, I can't talk here. You get yeah. to add your strength bonus uh, times one point five. So, if your strength is plus two to attack, you add three. In other words, you add two plus half again, three. Yeah. If you use it two-handed, that's how that works. If you use it one-handed, it's just your strength bonus. <laughs> so did you buy a weapon i will get well, you never know when you may need it and when you know the <clears throat> your team will abandon you i will get a long sword oh you, you bought it yeah okay it's 15 gold pieces mark that off and put long sword yeah time oh, to rumble 48 now there you go that's good. Enough. That's it. You got food, you got water, you got clothes on your back, backpacks, pouches. You got spare coin in your pouch. You got a long sword to kick ass with, a mastercraft quarter staff to really kick ass with, and uh and a giant spell book on your back. Probably in your backpack. So there you go. You're all set really.
I need to, you told me we need to put, uh, uh, after that, you, we need to put a height or weight or something like this, you said? Uh, in the basic game, it really doesn't go into that detail, like what's your height, what's your age, what's your hair color. You can add hair color and things like that. You can get as crazy as you want. But in the core rules, it actually goes into this stuff. So, you know, there's actually rules for this. But yeah, yeah. if you want to come up with that stuff, you're welcome. Like, how old are you? Elves, it could be a little tricky because they they have yeah. a different age span. Am, uh, so we'll do that yes, when I, I when I pull out the book. But your your hair color and your eyes, yes. you can pick whatever you want. You want to be a tall elf? Go for it. I can look that up too if you want. Uh, I will be a, a giant elf. Uh, oh, the tallest people. Yeah. Hi, elves. There is one thing I do want to cover that the basic game does not cover, and it's languages. Okay. And how languages work is for <coughs> you, for an elf, you start off knowing elven and common, okay. common tongue. Yeah, so, English. so write down elven and common. And common, what it is, it's basically the common language, the trade tongue. It's what traders use, and it's very often used in civilized places. It's known as common. Okay. Uh, humans speak it, dwarves, elves, any of the races <clears throat> that encounter each other in trade. It's <clears throat> common <Yeah>. tongue. <clears throat> so it's it's a very simple language. Uh, I won't. Well, I won't go any further with that. But you also add your intelligence modifier as additional languages. Your intelligence modifier is plus. One second. Uh, my intelligence modifier is plus four. Right. So you get four additional languages, and I'm going to give you a list of yep. languages commonly known by elves. And okay. you, you pick four of these. The languages are important because it helps you understand what the hell people that you might encounter are saying. Uh, yeah. It allows you to read and write and speak. <clears throat> how, many, yeah, how many languages do the dwarf know? Nothing, zero. Well, it depends on their in intelligence. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty okay, high. Dwarf, dwarfs are stupid. Oh, it's terrible, terrible. All right. Here's the languages you can pick from. You get four additional languages. Celestial, which is like a language of uh, angels and, and things of that nature. Uh, extraterrestrial beings, whatever you can imagine. Draconic is the language of dragon-type, lizard-type creatures. Okay. Knoll, G-N-O-L-L. -L. That's Knolls are like uh, jackal beast men. They're nasty fellows. Of, terrible, okay. but... There are a humanoid in the world. Gnolls. Mm -hmm. Gnome. Goblin. Orc. <clears throat> yeah. And Sylvan, the language of the woods, nature, and fae. The Sylvan language. Okay. Okay. I will, uh, is more? That's it. Okay. I will pick Draconic. Okay. Orc. Okay. Sylvan. Sylvan. Yeah. And uh, tell me the, uh, the what is remaining. I have one option. I, don't I forgot. Goblin, gnome, gnolls, and celestial. Gnolls is what? Are they these creatures? Huh? They're like orcs. They're savage beasts. They're like part jackal humanoid creatures. Very savage. Well, I, I will speak gnome so I can talk to, to Ian. <laughs> All right, gnome. <clears throat> All right, so there's your languages. That I did want to cover, and that's from the core rule book. Now, those, there's lots of languages in the world, but uh, those are the ones common amongst elves. Yeah. And... So you're good. You're quite intelligent. You can speak fluently in different languages. Awesome. Common and Elven. Uh, good job. He doesn't depend on my charisma, says Richard. Uh, <laughs> the gnome from the north awaits 
you bean pole. <coughs> <coughs> Bloody hell, I am already pushing one spell book around. Don't let me buy another one. I will get a hernia. Six pack of beer. Good job. It doesn't depend on my charisma, says Richard. <laughs> I know plenty of languages, bad, foul, and Mongolian. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Mongolian. Nice touch. There's no, there's no place like Gnome. Oh, God. You know, <clears throat> yeah, you'd, make, you'd actually make a good Gnome because Gnomes can be annoying with their humor. They just keep going on and on and on. You'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this, Ian or Richard? That's Ian. Ian? <laughs> Yeah. He's a grumpy and grumpy gnome. He's gonna he's gonna be the gnome that uh, follows you around, Nick. <clears throat> yeah, he can carry my, he can carry my boots if he can handle it. Yeah. <laughs> what a storyline that maybe, is. Maybe they would be too big for him. He can sleep in the boots. Yeah. Yeah, they they are kind of small. They're not yeah. they're not as small as you might think. You know, thinking garden no. gnomes here. These are uh. I, don't know, I have to check hobbits. the book. Like, I've like never hobbits, actually I guess. played a gnome. Like hobbits, yeah. <coughs> like <clears throat> All right. So anyway, you've got your equipment. You got your spell book. You've got your skills. Uh, okay. You've got your single feet that you needed. You got your languages. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's go a little step further. And. If I can find it, I, I haven't looked this up in a long time. In fact, I will have to go to the table of contents here to find something here. Sure. Do you have any questions so far? No, 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 very clear. It's fine. Oh, your alignment. Something I skipped. Let's see, page 166 in the core book. There's all kinds of good stuff here. I want to pull that up your alignment that is how you view the world it's in terms of good and evil uh okay. chaos and order okay i don't allow evil and typically most campaigns don't because it doesn't really fit the heroic side of a campaign yeah uh, they're usually the bad guys yeah so Uh, alignment <clears throat> how you view law and order okay uh, there is lawful there is neutral and there is chaos does your character follow laws does he obey does he believe in order uh, does he believe in a uh, government and following government is he a liar is it bad to lie? These are pretty much associated with law. Mm -hmm. uh, lawful characters tend to follow written uh, things to, to the word. They keep their oaths. They don't believe in lying. They believe in governments. They believe in, in law and order is the way of uh, the world should be. Neutral bounces in between. Chaos is the opposite. They just like, uh, screw law. You know, that's like rebels. And that's how you view government law and order. Now, how you view good and evil, in other words, killing and lying and cheating and stealing, those are three also, three different levels of that. There's good, there's neutral, and there's evil. So what you do for your alignment is you pick how you view good and evil and how you view law and order. <clears throat> yeah. You could be lawful good. You could be neutral chaotic. You could be lawful neutral. And let me give you an example. A common, a common alignment is what is called chaotic good. A chaotic good character acts as if his conscience directs him with little regard for what others expect of him. He makes his yep. own way but he's kind and benevolent. He believes in goodness and right, but has little use for laws and regulations. He hates it when people try to intimidate others and tells them what to do. He follows his own moral compass, which, although good, 
may not agree with that of society. Chaotic good combines a good heart with a free spirit. So we have neutral, lawful, chaotic, and the other one is good, neutral, and evil. evil. You can't be evil. Without evil. Without evil. We cannot be evil. So we have uh, neutral, lawful, chaotic, and the other choice is good and neutral, correct? Right. Uh, uh, neutral means what? That he's... Uh... He's in between. He bounces around. Like, for instance, uh, I just read to you chaotic good. Here's neutral good. A neutral good character does the best that a good person can do. He is devoted to helping others. He works with kings and magistrates, but does not feel be beholden to them. Neutral good means doing what is good and right without bias, for or against order. Well, I decide I am neutral, neutral. True neutral. Hmm. True neutral. See if this fits your concept. A neutral character does what seems to be a good idea. He doesn't, he doesn't feel strongly one way or the other when it comes to good versus evil or law versus chaos. And thus, neutral is sometimes called true neutral. Most neutral characters exhibit a lack of conviction or bias rather than a commitment to neutrality. Such a character probably thinks of a good thinks of good as better than evil. After all, he would rather have good neighbors and rulers than evil ones. Still, he's not personally committed to upholding good in any abstract or universal way. Some neutral characters, on the other hand, commit themselves to philosophically philosophical philosophically to neutrality. They see good, evil, law, and chaos as prejudices and dangerous extremes. They advocate the middle way of neutrality as the best, most balanced road in the long run. Neutral means you act neutrally and naturally in any situation without prejudice or compulsion. It's an interesting character to attempt. Uh, to be truly neutral is, I think that's really challenging role-playing wise. You're going to find yourself in a lot of situations where do I help my friend or not because I have myself to think of or this other character to consider. And you get into all these little uh, situations. It's a very interesting character to play. But again, they're not really devoted to what's good or evil and they're not devoted to chaos and uh, law and order to any level they're really just in between that's a really tricky character to play yeah true neutral I, I, to be honest i think it would really be challenging but uh as a beginning character i don't recommend it because what's going to happen is you're going to play the game you're going to be true neutral but more often than not you're not going to be true neutral you're going to be more like a acting like a chaotic good or a neutral good character and as we play the game i'll eventually slip you into the right alignment that fits how you're actually playing that works okay. better than penalizing somebody for not playing their alignment <clears throat> okay. I, I then will be i'll tell you what because my character i will be uh lawful uh good. lawful neutral lawful neutral yeah Lawful neutral character X as law, tradition, or a personal code directs him. Order and organization are paramount. He may believe in personal order and live by a code or a standard, or he may believe in order for all and favor a strong organized government. Lawful neutral means you are reliable and honorable without being a zealot. Yeah, that's the one. Is that the one? Lawful neutral. So you like law and order and government and following oaths and things. That's your thing. But yeah. you're neutral when it comes to doing good or evil. Yeah, it, right? it, yes. Okay. We'll try that. Lawful neutral sounds good to me. You come from the elven traditions and the elven homelands. So 
you're going to be lawful because of that alone. Uh, your choice of neutrality is an interesting one. Uh, I think I think this is something that will be really fun to play. I think you'll be a, a pain in the ass to the other characters because you're so – everything's got to be done a certain way. It's law and order is the way. But you're neutral when it comes to the good and the evil. And I think there's going to be some clashes in uh, – among some of the other characters' personalities, yes. from what I know. Because, yes, yes, yes. Because elves are difficult, the humans, and, you know, they are lawful, but if you don't like someone or if you don't like the race, they're, you know, they're a bit biased. So yeah. it is in this character, you know? James in the chat brings up a good uh, uh, one way to look at good and evil in the game. And it, it's actually a really, really good one. He says, one way to look at it is that a good character is more likely to work for the group, the other characters, whereas an evil one is working against the group. They're very yes. selfish individuals, good and evil. Uh, but I'm not allowing evil. So you got to be good or neutral. You're lawful neutral. That works for me, I th think. I think it'll be fun to play anyway. Let me double check something here, Nick. <clears throat> Yeah, lawful neutral. You're reliable and honorable without being devoted to doing good deeds. Not yeah. goody two shoes. I like it. Yeah, I like it too. Yeah, it's good. Lawful neutral, folks. Our elven wizard <clears throat> fits. I'm gonna write this down. Alignment A L. Lawful neutral or L N. If you want to abbreviate it, Nick. Yeah. You got a name, got all your stats, all the basic stuff is pretty done. Uh, there is, let me pull out my core book here and zip past alignment. Uh, chaotic evil. Age. Let's roll up your age and see how old your elf is. Uh, you can always pick your age. Yeah. Excuse me. Let me give you an age range and you just pick one. Middle age is 175 years old. All right, let's, do you have dice? Uh, wait, six-sided? Uh, yeah, six-sided dice. To, to pick an age? I'm going to let you roll this one up. Yeah, okay. Wait. <sighs> okay. Just for, just for fun. <laughs> he starts off. Yeah. All right. Tell me when you're ready. <clears throat> yeah, I'm fine. One dice, huh? One die. Ten D six. Ten D six. Ten D six. No, let me get them. Wait. <sighs> He's gonna be old. It's ten D six plus one hundred and ten. Ten. I don't want to be old. Okay. 10d6 total. I roll 10d6. 10d6. Yes. yes. 10d6 total. Wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want me to add it together? All of them together. One. Uh, 26 plus 110 136 you are 136 years old quite typical for a wizard type elf uh 
just to let you know, when you reach about 175, mm -hmm. you're considered middle-aged for an elf. So, so I'm like uh, mid thirties. Like, right, you're 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 in your adulthood. Uh, you're good to go. Uh, okay. Yeah. How about height and weight? You want to roll that up too? Sure, right, roll it. Wait, wait. Let me see. Uh, to determine the character's height, roll the modifier dice indicated on table 7-3 and add the result in inches to the base height of your character race and gender. Oh. Let's see. There's all kinds of races of elves here. I'm going to take a... No, it's actually not. You're a male elf. Your base height is five foot four. Mm -hmm. Your modifier is two d eight. Do you have eight sided two. die? Um, I think I have eight. I have. Uh, no, I have ten and twelve. I got. I got you running around looking for dice. Do you have two d eights? No, I have a ten and a twelve. I don't have eight. No. All right, I'm going to roll 2d8 for you. Okay. A 6 and a 4, so a 10. 10 inches. So you're 5 foot 4 plus 10 inches. Let me write this down. 5 foot. What is the base? 5 foot 4? Yeah. Plus 10 inches, so you're 5 foot 14, really. 6 foot 2? Yeah. You're 6 foot 2. Yeah. Now you Short. are tall. I'm Short, shorter. you're tall. I'm shorter than my real life. 6 <laughs> foot 2 is tall. I'm only 5 foot 8. <clears throat> I'm 6 foot 3. Are you really? You want to be you want to be six foot three? I'll let you be six no, foot three. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Six foot two is fine. I don't mind. I'm serious. <laughs> Some people like that. They like that tall, like themselves. That's you're tall. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm six foot. Yeah. Poor Ian. He's only five foot one. Uh, I'm, yeah. sorry. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm short though. I'm a, I'm only five foot eight, five foot nine on a good day. Yeah, I think one. Ian's I think about the same. Five. I thought Ian was huh? one foot five. <laughs> He's not that small. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm already carrying your bloody book. <laughs> I fancy being a gnome. I shall have, I shall have to create my backstory. I do hate bloody elven wizards, though. That's great character. Character. Uh, definitely a pain in the ass. Sturgrim is going to love him not. Uh, he can use his staff as a walker. Oh, God, six foot two. Is Ian a troll? <laughs> no, I'm only five. I'm only five foot one. If I stand on a box, how tall are you, Ian? Seriously, I know you're not a tall guy, but I, I don't. I don't see his. Are you five foot one? <coughs> I'm five foot eight. Oh, your weight. Yeah. Well, that's cool. You're a tall elf. Damn. Yeah, the story you followed, yeah. yeah. It's five foot four plus 2d8, and you got a 10, so that's 14. Yeah, that's six foot two. Wow. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let's go to weight. Let me see how you do that. See how if you're a big guy. To determine a character's weight, multiply the result of the modifier dice by the weight multiplier and add the result to the base weight for the character's race and gender. Uh, <clears throat> base weight is 100 pounds for a male elf. Uh, weight multiplier is times three pounds. Oh, you roll the same dice that we just rolled? 
2d8. <coughs> ah, yeah. You mark... Rogues is yeah. All right. So you roll 2d8 again, just like we did, only you multiply the result by th three pounds. And that's the addition to your base. Where the hell did my dice go? D8s. All right. I think I did that right. Five and three. It's eight. So eight times three pounds, 24 pounds. 24 added to your base weight of 100. So you're 100 and 124 pounds. Looks good. What's this, in, what's this in kilos? Have an idea? No idea. Not without my I'll, little. I will check now. I want to see if I'm a fat bastard. <laughs> you're not. You're you're thin. You're tall okay. and thin. Hundred. Bruce Lee was like five 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 four, and he, at his lightest, he was like a hundred and twenty five pounds. Yeah, he was muscular. Yeah. So I have this lean. Yeah, okay. You are lean. Lean, mean machine. Num, num killing machine. Five foot four. What? Six foot two. Sorry. Six foot two. And you're a hundred and how much? One, two, four pounds. Twenty-four <laughs> pounds. All right. Yeah, it's it's a thin, tall elf. I think it's perfect. Yeah. For an elf. Well, it's it's stinted that way. It's meant to be that way when you roll this up randomly. You're not gonna get a crazy fat elf. Yeah. <laughs> 50 kilos, you wimp. Is that what it is, Ian? About 50 kilos? 56.25 kilos. And I'm six foot two? I, I, I'm, an, I'm anorexic. <laughs> uh, chewing on twigs. <clears throat> and you're lawful neutral. Well, I'm glad we took that care of that. Now it's up to you. Your hair, your skin coloration, anything that you want to really stand out. Otherwise, I'll yeah. just make you normal. I have uh, I have black hair. You could write that down. Yeah. And well, you, judging from your picture, there you go. Yeah, from the picture, exactly. Yeah. I think black hair and uh, and uh, the skin is dark. I think, but as my picture is, I don't know. Excellent. Skinny wimp, <laughs> says Richard Durgram, the dwarf. Skinny oh, wimp. Oh, now, of course, know. of course, Richard. When we when we have our next session, none of this is known by your characters. I'll I'll, I'll bring him in in some dramatic way and fits the story, and you guys roll a play along with it. Uh, so yeah, develop some character connections that way be interesting i still have to work him up but now i can do it because i know what he looks like his stats and skills i could kind of work in uh where he's from why he's in sandpoint uh, or in the hinterlands and try, i got some ideas on how i'm going to introduce him it's quite uh different from what you'd expect i like to do the unexpected folks Yes. It's not going to be like walking down the path on the way to the dungeon. You meet this elf. Why? Hello. Introduce yourselves, please. It's not going to be like that. Very good. You might have a grim fight with some ogre uh, collecting tolls along the, the old road there. And you might have to do a battle with him. And one of his prizes kept in the back there is a is a rug wound up and tied on both ends. And as you finish off the ogre... You go to investigate the rug and see movement inside. There he is. There's your elf. That all. That, that's a good idea, but I'd be more dramatic with it. But I, I want to bring him in some little dramatic way that will uh, fit his character background. And, of course, the gnome hiding in the trees. <laughs> I don't know him. <clears throat> 
You never know. <clears throat> Any questions, Nick? About combat or how your stats work or any basic stuff or any of the stats you have that are <laughs> questionable. <laughs> Tell Richard I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> Check the hinterlands group, new picture of Nick's character. <laughs> oh Richard, you're gonna be in trouble when we go to the campaign. <laughs> yeah, he's good one finding <laughs> pictures. Are you kidding me? I can I can see the thumbnail already. <laughs> oh, skinny! <laughs> you, are <terrible. laughs> you are terrible, terrible. Uh, I have to excuse me. I have to. Wow. I have to change. Look, if we keep this photo, I have to change my alignment to uh, bisexual neutral. <laughs> bisexual neutral. That's a shame. Terrible. Get that out of there, Richard. Tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> very good oh man <clears throat> yeah there he is good times on his way to sandpoint <laughs> for god's sake it's i think i have this but this this is my body like this oh for god's sake no i think it fits your picture the one that you sent i think that i think you look a little bit uh stocky in the picture that you posted Maybe a little bit because you're six foot two and uh, 120 some pounds. That is that is really thin, but it's yeah, perfectly but acceptable for an elf. They look elegant no matter what. So I'm wearing I'm wearing many tunics in this photo. Yeah, it's the drain of your magical studies on your body. Perhaps that's yeah. why you're particularly thin, but not necessarily out of character thin. I don't think you look yeah. diseased. I think for for an elf, you probably look fantastic really yes six foot Four two minutes. 124 pounds right yeah, for good, for look for out when he good. look out when he rips his shirt off folks that's bruce lee <laughs> uh, <laughs> starts why, working why his, they, why, his magic the dwarves are making fun of me i mean who is richard <laughs> to talk he's three foot five i'm sure yeah i don't know if we worked up your weights and heights did we Richard, I don't think and, we did. And six hundred pounds. He's like a, he's like a bull. Yeah, they, they tend to be stocky fellows. Stocky fellows. Very stocky. <laughs> Skinny elf. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have also an identity card. What's this? I. <laughs> I didn't see the bottom part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, he looks like this, the uh, version of Justin Bieber. <laughs> in this, um, in this backpack, in this backpack, you, uh, I bought. Uh, Kurt uh, has also a thong because I'm wearing one. What? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Nick! Nick should hire some goblins to carry him around on a litter. Oh, the silliness begins. <clears throat> oh, rock and roll. Well, I hate this... go ahead, Nick. I hate dwarfs. Nothing else. Bring that into your character conception. Of course, I will. <laughs> but remember, but remember, don't hate them too much because they do have no, to interact no. with you in the group. But of course. it would create some really great role playing situations. Uh, if there was animosity showing, uh, yes, that would be you, you know met. typical, typical uh, yeah. elf that doesn't like dwarfs, obnoxious. There you go, haughty. Which is exactly how uh, how dwarves see elves, They're those tall haughty bastards, <clears throat> arrogant. Do you have any questions? No, no, it's fine. Everything is fine. We should be good. Uh, well, what's going to happen now is I will do some work on your character. And you should, too. Uh, yeah. If you want to expand on your write-up a little bit, feel free to do so. I'm going to take that, and I'm going to try and fit it in as best I can with where I want you to be from, where you fit in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how you're going to be interacting with the party 
in the next session. And you will be in the next session, I hope. Um, yeah, of course. And we should be good. So I don't know what else I have to cover. I think that's about it, Richard. I think he's all set and good to go. <laughs> remove Ian immediately from the group. You remove him immediately from the hinterlands. <laughs> Four foot one, 178 pounds. God. Write that down, Richard, because I'm not keeping that. <clears throat> if you want to be that size. That's that's broad. Four foot one. It's like my boots. My Four boots foot one. Four <clears throat> Oh, we're challenging me, huh? Okay. You guys are having a having a go here in the chat, uh, Facebook. They're, they're making fun of me. Wait and see. Forward, Lavender. We have work to do. <laughs> the anorexia group. <laughs> Forward, Lavender. <laughs> Oh my God, what have I created here? <clears throat> oh my God. Wait, wait, I'm, wait. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to retaliate. Wait, 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 no, wait. I found, I found, I found a picture of uh, Ian and Richard. Wait, I'm going to post it, wait. Oh, dear God. <clears throat> It's uh, from the previous campaign they were together. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so I have, I have all my stats now, Kurt. Huh? You're all set, as far as I can tell. Now we get into the actual gameplay. We'll probably have a little introduction for roles uh, as we go along. Just some basic things to help you once your character yeah, sure. gets in. Because I think as you watch the guys role play, because mm -hmm. you'll probably be a little bit before I bring you in directly, you'll be able to yeah, see cool. how it works in action. And yeah, I'll have it on good. video. I'll have it on video so you guys can watch as well. I'm going to try and post these live plays as well. Uh, then you'll kind of have an idea of how it works, and then we'll gradually slip you in. Should be yeah, fun. For sure. Yeah, Should for, be sure, fun. for sure. Yeah. Fun and interesting. Uh Richard is built like a brick shit house, apparently. <laughs> See, it's four foot one, hundred and seventy-eight pounds. He's a wide one. Yeah, this, this, this man is not moving. He's rolling. Yep. <clears throat> wait, 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 wait! I will retaliate. Wait one second. And that is my mini target. In case anyone's wondering, that's my miniature version of my my bigger version vape. So I got two versions of the same thing. So he's the size of a dwarf. Yeah. This one only goes to 40 watts. That's the only difference. The battery is self-contained. You can't take it out. Uh, that's the other difference. Otherwise, the same thing. It's just the mini version, uh, which I'm using right now. Because my other one's charging. I'll let you guys bicker about, but I'm glad you guys watched. Did you enjoy that? I mean, seriously, I don't. It's the first <coughs> time I've done any kind of role playing. 
uh, live videos for you guys. Hopefully there'll be a lot more and get those live plays going. I'm going to add a lot more to the channel that's more mainstream. It's not going to be all live streams. So when I get content to put up eventually for this channel. I hope to get some uh, little series up, like episode so-and-so of this series. So you can it'll tell a story and you can follow along. But the thing is, you know, this is just learning, and it's kind of crude right now. Uh, everybody's just getting used to the rules and role playing <coughs> to begin with, so it's a little crude, but it'll get a lot better. I am positive. And right now it's a theater of the mind style campaign so it's all looking at our faces pictures i put up of characters they meet maps and things there'll be a second camera during the game session for players to see their models and where they are in relation to opponents uh that's a little game camera just for the players uh you probably won't see that too much if you're watching but a lot of it'll be theater of the mind eventually it's going to be fantasy grounds which is just as fun to watch uh, you get all the maps, all the dice rolls. You see all the dice rolls. Uh, and that that's later when I get a, what's the name? Rise of the Rune Lords going. So that's going to be pretty much, not all of it, but quite a bit of it's going to be a run through Fantasy Grounds. And you'll be able to see all that stuff going on and follow along and listen to us role play in the dark caverns. How was that? Mm, my squeaky chair. I love this chair. Ah, very comfortable. And I love my mic. I think it's going to really do us up good to, when we play our sessions for role playing, among other things. <clears throat> In fact, let me turn my gain up because I love my gain. Ah. Yeah, it wasn't too difficult, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Pathfinder is known as a a very crunchy game, full of rules, rules for everything. But actually, I have seen a whole lot worse. <laughs> Role Master is, is very tedious, especially with combat, if you ever heard of Role Master on Space Master. But I think this, if you've played this game long enough like I have, I played it back in the third edition of D&D, which is in the early 2000s. That's when I played it, and that was before Pathfinder. <clears throat> D&D went to version four, which was a joke and it killed the game. And a lot of people that loved D and D three stuck with it. Paizo picked it up and kept it, improved it and called it Pathfinder. And that was like over a decade ago and it's still going. Uh, same original edition with corrections and errata, of course, to keep it alive. But that's how it works. It's a great game system, great version of a, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, D20 based. In other words, most everything is done with a D20 roll. You're after a target number. In other words, roll D20, add your modifiers, and try and equal or exceed uh, uh, a DC, which is the, what does is, what is that stand for? I can never remember. It's the difficulty, oh, sub, difficulty number. It's, it's, you're after a target number that the GM keeps secret like 10 or greater and you try and get it that's all it is and it's all about role playing your successes role playing your failures role playing your interactions uh and just it's great fun so storytelling it's not all laughing and stuff it, is, it can get pretty serious fun i like that uh we get pretty dramatic with our storylines i try to anyway it, but it's really fun love telling stories like this Interactive storytelling. There you go. It was interesting to watch and the character being created. I just read that twice. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm glad you guys liked it. We're going to do it again. I don't know when the next session is going to be. Probably relatively soon because this is what I'm focused on at the moment. I've got some other things for the Dash of a lot I'm working on. But <clears throat> I'm focused on this primarily for my own uh, gaming because uh, it fits my schedule uh, so that's the deal and I'm losing my voice thank god I got this microphone <clears throat> uh, 
Difficulty class, DC. Difficulty class, DC. Thanks, Richard. And thanks, Matt. And as I go down the road here, I, I typically only play, oh, excuse me, only four players is ideal. Uh, I might handle more in the future at one time. But if I get a bunch of people to pick from in case somebody can't make it, that's even better. And if I, if I can run two groups at the same time separate, that's possible too. So you guys are always welcome to join. Watch the videos. See what you think. Learn the game as we play because that's what it's about. It's about learning how to play Pathfinder. Not all the complex stuff that comes with later stuff with Pathfinder, like the advanced players handbook that, you know, there's just, they add way too much to the game, in my opinion, especially if you're new and see what you think. And uh, Rise of the Rune Lords is going to be a blast. Yeah, it's good, huh? Sexy voice and all. All right, guys. We got four viewers. What's going on here? <clears throat> There's nothing left to talk about, and I'm losing my voice. I am going to shut this down. I'm going to keep the chat going if you want to join. The links are posted in the group. Join if you can. Right now, I'm going to call it quits at the moment, though, and take the live off. Losing my voice. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, tell tell Ian and Richard I posted their photos from the campaign. They heard you. Also, also James, uh, I've been looking at it, but I don't get past the introduction because I'm I'm still doing other things. I can't focus on reading it. <laughs> Just can't swing it to be honest with you. But it's right here next to me. I plan to do it. It's one of my first things I want to do. Just. For the time being, I don't plan on playing it uh, too soon yet. Not yet. Uh, the main thing I want to do is look at the first chapter, get into that, and see how I'm going to work it into the campaign as it is now. Because if you don't know, I've been using Sandpoint and the Hinterlands for my own home brew, my own type of thing. But I want to keep the setting intact for Rise of the Rune Lord. So there might be <coughs> some changes. Like maybe the mayor is a little bit different uh, in my version than in the standpoint of Rise of the Rune Lords. Little things might be different, but I have to work that up. That's the next step, fitting it all together into one campaign. We really haven't done a hell of a lot with our learning campaign yet, so not much changes really to make, but uh, mostly in the NPCs, a couple of the locations maybe in Sandpoint. Uh, that's about it really. See you, Ian. I'll let you know when we're on again. Probably do something tomorrow. Uh, it's what is it? tomorrow's Friday. Yeah, probably do something tomorrow. And thanks everybody for all the best wishes you sent me. Uh, really appreciated it. These chats really help me uh, get through my little difficult time. And I really appreciate it. And I've been looking forward to this today in particular because it's good. It's good to talk the hobby. And this hobby has always been more than an escape. <coughs> I'm not just talking about role playing. I'm talking about miniatures, the whole thing, nine yards. It's a great hobby. And whenever you're going through tough times, I highly recommend this hobby. Get into it. Have it there as something to fall back on when times do get tough. It's a great hobby. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate that and thank all you guys for that. So with that, I think I'm going to go offline. Nick and me will be on here for a little bit more if you want to join. My voice is shot. <clears throat> and it definitely brings people together. It definitely does. Everything we've done, whether it's tabletop commanders or now the rogues, it brings people together in a new way. And it's really satisfying for me to see that to experience it and to help people get more involved and more out of the hobby. Uh, I love seeing that. My work is done. If just one person out there in the world says, you know what? I like that. You really did a great job. and gives me a thumbs up. 
<clears throat> that makes me happy. All right, guys, I'll see you all later. We're taking the live off. So if you want to join, link's still up. Uh, if you need the link, let me know. Facebook. Take care, folks. Hope you enjoyed. Like, share, subscribe, leave comments. Always appreciated. Take care, my friends.